morning and welcome to the MICAS Education Conference, Connecting with Nature, Placemaking and the Urban Garden. Thank you. We have quite the busy and exciting program for you this morning, but before we go any further, I'd like to just remind you all to kindly switch off your mobile phones or keep them on silent and away from you. I would like to first introduce the chairperson of the Malta International Contemporary Art Space, Mrs. Phyllis Muscat, to give her welcome address. Good morning. Dear friends of MICAS, welcome to this year's MICAS Education Conference, Connecting with Nature, Placemaking, and the Urban Garden. This is the second conference in a series of conferences envisaged by MICAS for its education and community engagement and program strand. It's our responsibility as a public cultural organization to facilitate participation and widen the discussion. The purpose of these conferences, therefore, is to spur the public conversation on these issues that are relevant to society and to contemporary art. This is in part how we want to realize the remit for MICAS as an international platform for debating the pressing challenges of contemporary culture through knowledge, exchange, and public engagement. I would like to give a warm welcome to our keynote speakers, Professor C.J. Lim from the Bartlett School of Architecture and Dr. Mario Balsan from the Malta College of Arts, Science and Technology and our panelists, Professor Elizabeth Conrad from the Division of Environmental Management and Planning within the Institute of Earth Systems, University of Malta, Mr. Anton Gregg, an artist and head of the Visual Arts Department at the Faculty of the Built Environment, University of Malta, Mr. Stephen Saliba from the Environment and Resources Authority, and Mr. Andrew Dara, horticultural and garden design consultant. Our moderator for today's panel is architect Conrad Bahajar. I thank them all for accepting our invitation and making this conference possible. I would also like to express my sincere gratitude to the Education Committee, chaired by Dr. Georgina Portelli, and the Education Committee members, architect Conrad Buhajar, Dr. Valerie Vizanich, Dr. Katya Mikalev, and Sina Faruja. Their dedication and unwavering commitment make it possible to host such events that facilitate artistic dialogue and shed light on contemporary concerns. Finally, my deepest thanks go to the MICAS team for the hard work and dedication in putting up this conference. We hope that you will enjoy the stimulating presentations and discussion, and we look forward to your questions and interaction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Muscat. And our first keynote speaker for this morning is CJ Lim, Professor of Architecture and Urbanism at the Bartlett School of Architecture in London. And Professor Lim's research has actually been widely published and he has participated in over 200 international lectures. Professor Lim's presentation will be followed with a short Q&A session. Please welcome Professor CJ Lim. Hello. Yeah. I guess I'll start off with saying Kif Intom to you. And I hope you're well. And uh, I'm very, very honored and privileged to be invited by Mikas, uh, by Georgina and Phyllis to be part of this conference. I'm terribly, terribly honored. And to be in your beautiful city. I've never been to your city before. And the first time I really feel mesmerized. I feel like I'm transported into a completely different realm um, because it's just simply beautiful. And I cannot, you know, there are no words to describe your beautiful city. So I will certainly be coming back um, to take a much deeper look at everything that you have to offer. Um, from the beautiful architecture to the land, to the sea, and the incredible food that you have. I'm gonna speak about romance and resilience in the context of landscapes of the imagination. Um, and I think one of the things that I would like you to 
suspend disbelief for a moment rather than say, is this a solution? Because I only believe in really presenting sort of to you uh, questions in a way rather than solutions this morning and to all my clients and everybody who has listened to me. Um, I think we are, as a society, as a world, we have been so solutions orientated that sometimes we forget about how to imagine and dream for bigger and more exciting things that sometimes might come, you know, um, success might be one thing, but there's also a possibility of failures. So risk-taking is important. Last night, for example, the professor from the University of Malta, when he was giving descriptions about food that we'll be eating last night, he talked about fear. And I think everything with the built environment comes with an element of risk and fear. This is Thomas Cole's dream of Acadia. Romantically depicts humans um, idyllic relationship with each other, and also uh, the harmonious relationship with unspoiled nature. But I would encourage you that every time you speak of, you, you look at this uh, painting, I want you to think for that very day, in, on August, 6th of August, 1945, when a 9,000-pound U-23 bomb was dropped over the city of Hiroshima, you know, by a U.S. plane. This was what happened. And the thing is that here, at this moment, on that very day, everything evaporated from the city, except 170 ginkgo trees. Um, in around 55 locations. It's incredible. I really, really, uh, the message here is that we cannot keep fighting each other. And the thing is that maybe the trees, metaphorically, could educate us about, you know, harmoniously relating to each other. And what is extraordinary about these trees is that after a few days of this terrible event, while everything has disappeared, as you can see from this image here, the trees, the branches started to sprout. Little, little buds came out, which is extraordinary. Humans couldn't survive it, but the trees did. One thing was because they have deep, deep roots that anchored them, but also allowed them to continue to survive. They are known as the survivor trees in Japan. And over years, they represent that optimistic um, hope that actually the, of endurance and the importance of peace and resilience. We are all probably familiar, for those who are architects, are familiar with this project here, the temple in Sapporo by the architect Tadeo Ando, the Pritzker Prize winner. And the thing is that, you know, after the Fukushima, uh, tsunami and the nuclear reactor meltdown, um, Ando actually, together with the survivors of that zone, planted a forest um, in response to the, this whole devastation. And it was very similar to a project he did after the Kobe earthquake, where they planted nearly a quarter million trees that bloom, that blossoms, that has white blossoms. And, and it wasn't a solution as such, but it gave people hope for the future because, you know, he was really interested in saying, well, this is what Tando said, while I create buildings, I dream the day will come when children gather and read books under huge trees. Planting trees is the most important of my tasks in life. The Ariel Sea has all but dried up completely. I'm sure you have seen really terrible pictures of this whole sea drying up. This, and the thing is that, you know, what exists currently is this wind cloud sweeping, you know, of what is remained. And it has become a depository of chemical waste and pollution. The thing is that the local community has not given up. 
what they do every day, rain or shine, they just turn up and plant these trees in the lake itself. Knowing full well, they will never see the trees mature in their lifetime, but they are planting for the future. Abbas here grew up with olive trees and spent his lifetime nurturing them. This is in Afghanistan. The orchard's history is his history, the country's as well. The olive trees were not only trees, but also a promise. A promise not so long ago that this troubled land of this impoverished country, that peace could happen. So the trees also symbolize the hope for the future. This gentleman here is William Stanley Mervyn. He was a US poet laureate. And he and his wife, Paula, has nearly 3,000 palm trees in their Mervyn palm uh, forest. He basically are preserving them. To him, it probably is his final sort of ecological poem and his lyrical expression of resilience. Saving trees, you know, is not a new thing. In 1973, a group of women in the Himalayan forest hugged trees to stop sort of commercial loggers and developers from taking away these ash trees, 300 of them. And they are known as the Chipko um, tree-hugging women. And so tree-hugging is not a new thing. So, and, but what was really effective is save many, many of the ash trees in the Himalayas. In all ecological stories, women who took risks to defend the environment brought trees into their very heart of the struggle for power. For example, this lady here, Wangari Matai, the, no the 2004 Nobel Peace Prize winner. She engaged over 900,000 women in Kenya to plant three to plant 30 million trees over the course of many years. Matai was a force of nature. They associate her with the acacia tree, um, which is all to do with being able to survive the ha harshest of conditions. But the authorities were not happy with her. They call her the rebellion. She caused disruption. And for that, she got knocked unconscious. But she survived. She survived a lot of abuse over time. She was lucky she survived, unlike the following people that I'll describe. Chico Mendes, the Brazilian rubber tapper, was murdered in 1988. He supported the preservation of Amazonian rainforests. Kanuli Saro Wiwa, he was murdered in 1995. He spoke up against decades of environmental damages in Nigeria. Enan Bedoya in Colombia, shot 14 times in 2017. He protested against deforestation. Maria do Espirito Santo and her husband here, Jose, also shot by gunmen in an ambush in 2011. They were fighting for the preservation of forests again in the Amazonian forest. They were trying to carry on the work that Chico actually started. Father Tentorio, he was actually shot eight times outside his parish because he dared to speak up in defense of the land that belongs to the, the um, indigenous community and also preserving the forest that they own. These people that I just named, there's a small number. They bravely took a stand to defend human rights, their land, and their environments. In just 20, 2021, two years ago, the NGO Global Witness informed us that at least 200 land and environmental activists were killed across 22 countries 
almost three a week. That's absolutely shocking to speak the truth, to defend your land, to defend human rights. Part of the problem with deforestation is to do with consumerism, that I guess all of us are slightly guilty to a degree because cattle and soya bean production is, they are the two biggest culprit of, of this really unspeakable sort of activity that goes on around the world. It doesn't just affect the Amazon forest, it, it has affected large borders of South Asia. You can see, you know, smoke coming, you know, deforestation smoke coming right across South Asia from Indonesia, from Thailand to other countries. Trees and other forms of nature are living monuments. And the things that they are, are environmental heroes, heroes, and we should not forget and undervalue them. Just as the landscapes paintings of the Romanticism train a, a devastation towards nature, cultivating an outlook, whimsical and critical, imaginative and participatory, so too do the resilient landscapes of smart cities. What you would ask me, what is a smart city? Smart cities is the um, establishment of an ecological symbiosis between nature and built form to create diverse resilient landscapes, including and beyond urban agriculture. The resilient landscapes address simultaneously the threat and the fundamental human requirements to protect, to provide, and to participate. We will start with this, the landscape of absence from my practice. Um, this is a proposal for the city of Tangshan after the earthquake. That devastated much of the city. So what we kept for this development was uh, only the, the structural foundation. We did not want to to create a park where you know you plant flowers and and so forth. What we did was say, say the kind of the fury of nature has to be has to serve as a memory to remind us that nature could be kind but also sometimes angry. And here we just wanted the moss and grass to grow over the foundation to keep it as a kind of embossed landscape. But we planted trees. We planted these. Um, these battalion of poplar trees standing upright to give spirit and hope to the community, to say that, you know, we are strong and we can behold any sort of fury of nature. The inspiration, sorry, the inspiration for that project came from the women of the Haitian village after their hurricane in 1987. They said, we planted the trees to save the children to the, in school. We are still planting trees because we are still worried about our children. We are planting trees because there's nothing else we can do. We are just planting trees. Vandana Shiva, an active environmental activist, she said that, I always say my professors were the trees and the women of Chipko the tree hugger women, yeah? That's what moved me into activism, my ecological leaning, my biodiversity learning. She also add that we are either going to have a future where women lead the, the, the way to make peace with the earth, or we are not gonna have a human future at all. In one of our projects here in Africa, we thought of planting vines to give economical support to the women. As part of the scheme, they would be the guardian angels of the baobab trees, which are under threat. Over the last few years, for some strange reason, even scientists could not figure out why, the baobab trees are all dying away. And the thing is that, you know, it's in, it should be something that should be preserved. It's very much of the heritage of certain continents of this world. Um, and the project also looks into the kind of gender bias, uh, occupational patterns, and also patterns of land ownership. 
that women can't own land. They are not, you know, supposed to have a say in what they do with the land and how to cultivate them. And the thing is that the project is not so much about sort of throwing guilt as to they want to just promote equality and also say to promote forgiveness. The symbolism of female power here at different scales within the vast landscapes are represented in the color of the rainbow, the, the flora and the assemblage that what rain could provide, nature could provide. It was very much inspired by the Zulu goddess of uh, rainbow, rain, and agriculture. Cecile Jebet, the president of the African Women Network for Community Management of Forests, underlines that empowerment of women not only proves their, improves their lives, but also re the re resilience of entire families and communities in the fight against poverty and climate change. According to the United Nations, if women had the same access to agricultural resources as men, they would be able to increase output on their farms by 20 to 30%, raising the total agriculture production by 4% worldwide and reducing the number of people in the world uh, going hungry by 17%. We planted lychee trees in the next project. Um, and vegetables. The lychee trees and the diverse assortment of vegetables in this project in China are agents to reconcile the contrasting needs of urban growth and nature preservation, but also to continue China's agriculture and rural heritage, which is incredibly important because I have been advising the Chinese government for many years. One of the things that we have been saying is that development is important to them, but the loss of agricultural land and food production has become or will become even a greater issue when you have a huge population of billions. You can't just rely on importation. That's the key thing. So here, the planning was very much augmented and choreographed by the different planting from the lychee trees to the terraces of uh, vegetable uh, and agriculture. And the landscape was very much inspired and take form from the very beautiful landscape before any development was done to it, uh, of these sort of ter natural terraces. And, but also, I was very keen to preserve the farming culture that is fast disappearing in China because nobody wants to be a farmer in China, unfortunately. And when we spoke to these farmers, their aspirations were, sadly, to live in skyscrapers with air condition, where yet they have beautiful, beautiful farmhouses and land that they want to abandon. Or, worse still, they will sell their land and end up being construction workers instead of cultivating and having a harmonious relationship with nature, they would actually cultivate skyscrapers. And that is a common, common story in China itself. I, I think that it would be incredibly sad because China would be losing a very important part of the agricultural Arcadian legacy in a way. Cities are vulnerable and will increasingly be affected by climate change, natural catastrophe, urban stress, including chronic food and water shortages, pollution, migration, and growing age population. Every city has, or many bigger cities, uh, have the last problem of aging population. Um, you just imagine a, a life in near future society where well-being nature uh, has become a moral imperative that the older population is growing to a much older age. But I think, you know, one has to, 
governments have to realize that growing older, being able to live longer, doesn't mean that you have a high quality of life. You know, it doesn't equate that way. Pumping elderly with lots of medication to keep them alive doesn't mean that they have a better quality of life at all. And I think, you know, this is something that we need to be aware of in the way that we design our built environment, at least, you know, not that we can solve all the problems of aging, um, that we need to at least avoid loneliness for these elderly, which is key. Loneliness kills. It actually kills more people, at least in the UK, the statistics says, you know, if you were to smoke 15 cigarettes a day, you probably will have a less chance of dying from loneliness, you know. So what we propose is to stitch and patch up the cities uh, where, you know, there's lots of abandoned spaces, spaces which are not used in cities, railway tracks which are abandoned, you know, and these will become sort of the, what I call the garden for well-being for the elderly population. Um, so a 10 by 10 meter plot and 130 days temperate growing will probably provide a family with all the nutritional intakes of A, C, B, complex, and iron. And the National Institute of Health lists gardening, if you do it for 30 to 45 minutes a day, is almost equivalent to biking for five miles and walking for 20 uh, to two minutes in, in two miles in 30 minutes. William Morris, the utopian socialist, he promoted the idealism of factory gardens. Companies like Cadbury, Roundtree, and Leverhulme pioneered landscapes that were really interested as using landscape as a tool for social reform. The artist Agnes Dennis, in her project uh, called Wheatfield in Manhattan, um, it's a project that actually, what was interesting is that she asked us the question. She didn't give us the answer. She said, would you prefer to plant wheat and then the crop will only be worth 93 US dollars? Or develop the land that will bring you billions? And I think it's a very important question for all of us to answer. I mean, the things that we don't all have to be on the same side of the, of the story. But I think it's a piece that actually points out our misplaced priorities and deteriorating human values at many times. But, you know, for me, we don't have to have either or. So for the next project I'll show you, we can have both, where we have these offices, commercial spaces, embedded into the ground to give it better insulation for starters, but also to cultivate a landscape above it. So you almost have a coat of nature. In her case, if it's done by Dennis herself, it will be a wheat field above. Um, and, and then you still have the commercial spaces below. Obviously, we would not get the square footage that you want, but the thing is that, you know, it's a compromise. And I think, you know, in all our provocation and activism, we actually have to listen, we have to then consider, be thoughtful, and maybe we have to compromise because if it's just one side, we will never achieve anything. So the thing is that the idea is that this piece of office will be covered with uh, wheat, vegetables, whatever, that would then occasionally have these sort of wind funnels and you know uh, vents that pops up. We have probably seen this image many times over of Joseph Boyce. Um, in 1982, what he did was he, he wanted to provoke the city of Kassel in Germany. And he piled 7,000 stones in front, in the public square and, and in front of the museum. And the idea was that the pile would shrink every time a tree is planted in the city. I think this is wonderful. We should do this. Sorry, I'm not, anybody from, I don't want to provoke and upset anybody here. Um, the project is really to bring awareness more than anything else. I don't think it's about rebellion. I think, you know, 
I think it was wonderful. It brings awareness to every single citizen, um, you know, because they come across the city square every day. I think, so these are the piles of, of stones that, that has to be moved every time, you know, each one will disappear when a tree is planted. I think we should have this sort of negotiation in all our built environment, from housing, where we propose that, you know, at least one third of the square footage that you produce must be for some form of nature or food production. But awareness could come in different forms. We want, I want trees in the sky, right? This is a pop-up that we propose for the for City of London for a festival. And the thing is that, you know, we want these sort of temporary structures with nature to reach out to the heavens that brings awareness to adults and children alike. To say that, you know, this is very important to uh, nature is key and integral part of our lives and should not be forgotten. And Because the thing is that urbanization, especially with children, is that urban children, they have very few opportunities to get close to nature. Not everybody has a country house. Not everybody has holidays in the countryside. Not everybody could come across a goat, a sheep, or even a chicken. Uh, we all take for granted what we buy, the eggs that we buy in the supermarket, the milk that we drink or, and put into our coffee. You know, we don't consider where they come from. And there's a deprivation for urban children especially. And Richard Love warned that the well-being of urban children is compromised by nature's deficit disorder. And the thing is that, you know, this is really, really important, that, you know, maybe the older generation like myself, you know, we grew up, or at least I grew, grew up in the countryside. I grew up in the village uh, where my family had chickens running around in the house you know, and having, you know, fruit trees in the garden. Um, these are not unusual, but for the next generation, for example, my niece, she would not have that already. I'm gonna show you a series of images that exist in the next project we did in China. Um, and I just want people to, to engage, to, I want to engage you could you tell me what is this? Okay. This one? Shout out, shout out, come on. Pomelo. It's a, it's a family of the grapefruit. Mandarin. I think this audience is incredibly well informed, so there's no sort of disorder in the audience, I can assure you. But you'll be very surprised that I've shown this project to audiences around the world, and you'll be very surprised that a lot of them could not name half of them. And the thing is that, you know, th these are intelligent people. Um, so the thing is that, you know, it's really, really quite frightening in a way. So for the next, this project that we have in South China, in Guangzhou, um, you know, we were very sensitive about the ecological sort of condition that existed. We were very careful, instead of, you know, whacking skyscrapers onto the ground and getting rid of all, this whole thing, it's China's largest fruit production um, center, and it's enormous, and they want to develop it. They want to build skyscrapers there, and it's really, really sad. Um, so all we did was that we tidied up, we refurbished this orchard, this urban orchard, huge orchard. We are talking kilometers of it. And if you look at the edges, the, only the red bits were, were actually physically changed because the edges were spoiled by, were damaged by the floods and so forth. So the red side, I don't know if you could, on the right hand side, can you see the edges? 
they were the only parts we, we interfered with and also a spine that goes through it. That's all we did. The rest, we left it alone and we didn't do anything about it because we said that nature's pace, nature is money, nature is future. So, so the edges that were destroyed here, as you can see, so the plants, the, 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 the fruit trees were destroyed by, by flooding and so forth. We repaired it. And you can see on the top of the, the corners, you can see the change. I will. We did not actually just create, replanted the trees. We created orchards that would float. So when the flood comes, instead of you building walls to stop the nature from coming in, flood from coming in, there's no point. I can tell you this uh, because we need to engage with nature. We need to actually say, there's flood coming in. How can we play ball with them? How can we actually take advantage of what nature has provided? Even though it's, it's fury, angry, water, we wanted these orchards to float up and down. So the things that they're on rafts, like these, that would change configuration depending on the tide, depending on the season. And I think one of my criticism, you know, a little segue here, that when the Aswan Dam was built in Egypt, that killed agriculture along the banks of the Nile because what was really beautiful when the banks flooded, those were the areas that you, well, if you look at an aerial map of the oak and compare, they were the areas that you can actually grow food. They're, that's the area where people, livelihoods were. They can plant things there. But now, because man went and controlled it, it became, the banks would become, you know, they're no longer fertile. There's not enough water and, and so forth. And so the spine that we talked about has three things. It has orchards, it has urban agriculture, but also a running track. It's all geared towards well-being and health. We also have a reservoir there that would take in all the brown water from the city of Guangzhou, or not all of them, but a part of them, and filter it and clean it. It's not so much a logistically, you know, feasible thing that because you can't clean all the water, it could clean part of it. But it's also just like the, the pop-up sort of trees in the sky. Here, we wanted to bring awareness to the city that the thing that you, when you turn on the tap and you say, clean water, I can drink, they are very, very expensive. We should value them and not just take it for granted. And I think that's really important. And the things that we have a swimming pool next to it, so that when you're swimming in clean water that is safe for you and your children, you can smell the dirt of the brown water. You are aware of the dirty water next to it. I think the thing is that that's the only way of making people aware of the value of water, which is going to be more expensive than gold in years to come because clean water is going to be very rare because our reservoirs, our rivers, our lakes, they are polluted. They are polluted in one form or another. Strangely enough, we always end up with master plan projects where we have highways going through it. And the thing is that, you know, I think also we should really take a different look, have a different perception of what modernity has provided, you know, and not say that it's a problem, but what could it provide? What benefits would it bring? So the thing is that here, we started to look at, instead of building pavilions, we have a few kilometers of pavilions because we started to reuse the bottom of the highways. Instead of plant, because they are shaded, so you can't have, you know, you can have some species of plants there, but the things that, what we did was, remember William Morris? You know, he, you know, he actually inspired floral wallpaper. So instead of actually planting real plants, we have the, the artificial kind that is painted on the underside and columns of these highways. And the things that, you know, so there's a juxtaposition between, a poetic juxtaposition between the painted and the rail that you can see. But what is great about nature and is that, you know, unlike buildings, which buildings beautiful it may be, I mean, this room is absolutely stunning, I have to say this, um, is that they are not predictable. I think one of the things that 
is problematic in the sense that although I'm an architect, you know, we are trained to control, to control nature, to fight nature, to block everything out, you know. And what is great about landscapes and nature and things to do with plants is that you cannot predict what happens after you planted it. So apart from the plants you have, what you also have is the benefit of insects, reptiles, birds, fish, and everything that comes with it that you cannot control the position of. So you can't say, you know, this is where the door is, which is very specific, whereas you cannot say that this is exactly where the butterfly will be. So this is really, really what I'm trying to encourage, that we must see the extra bonus, the added value to each scheme that in, in anywhere, not just in China, but everywhere, that if you take nature into consideration and you consider it as a key player to your sort of resilient strategy, it will bring extra value. So the ecological symbiosis with nature offers a true model of resilience. Also, not just, you know, of survival, but also between food and the population. I think that's really important. So I was really, really, you know, taken by the, 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 the conversation and the talk given last night at dinner uh, by this professor at the U University of Malta about food and the history. So a project we did for the Korean government was that, again, they wanted to build skyscrapers in this part of land, which is farming. So we did, so no, 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 no. You keep all the farmland, and what we then inserted was these sort of four slabs that you contain all the sort of offices or whatever you want in there. And then, you know, and the rest is just punctuated by, so cherry trees, farmland, lotus where you can eat everything from, you know, the, 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 the flower, the buds, the roots, the whole, the whole works. Um, and then, oops. And to show its uselessness of grass, we just planted it onto the, what we call the building itself, these four long piers. I'm not actually discouraging or disparaging towards grass. But I think in this day and age, when many cities have food shortages and food costs rising, we need to make use of our, our land. You know, if we could plant potatoes, you know, in, um, in High Park in London during World War II to feed the nation, why can't we plant grass in, uh, uh, food in High Park now, you know, or any parks around the world in, in Central Park, in, you know? Because the thing is that, you know, it's really, really important that we are no longer in the age where we could just go and admire roses and daffodils in the park. I think that's something that we need to bear in mind. So, a few years ago, we did a land, I was part of the authorship of the Lancet Commission called Shaping Cities for Health in the 21st Century. We actually have a few key recommendations. One is that city governments should work with a wide range of stakeholders to build a political alliance, not just the people that has a voice. We need to engage everybody in the city or in any community, those who do not usually have a voice, probably has the most important things to say. Attention to health inequalities within urban areas should be focused on the planning of the built environment. I think, you know, we all know about health inequalities um, that really need to be addressed. I think more so during the pandemic than ever before. Actions need to be taken at the urban scale to create and maintain resilience. And the things that, you know, we can actually do sort of bottom-up initiatives, but I think the government should be part of this conversation too. A linear planning approach is insufficient because we need different prongs to really, really react to it and also allow failures too. We cannot say that, you know, we are so risk averse with the built environment projects, with projects and anything because it costs a lot of money. Everybody wants sort of risk assessment of every single bloody thing. I'm sorry to swear in the morning, sorry. And, and the thing is that we cannot do that. We sometimes have to take risks that you know, it would fail, but doesn't matter if we have enough sort of prongs, acupunctures into the system, some should be allowed to fail. And the urban planning for health needs to, as, as I said, need to 
encourage, emphasize experimentation. And otherwise, we would not progress as a uh, community. So last few slides here. Um, I'm telling you what I would like. And you will say to me, he is crazy. I have to say, I did not add this bit into the Lancet report because they probably would say I'm crazy too. I want my architecture and built environment to be this beautiful jaded green in spring. Summer and autumn comes. I want my architecture and buildings to change color, to have this rich auburn orange. And comes winter, it has this crystallized blueness to it. And I think, you know, these are things that we should really, when we think about the built environment, it doesn't matter if it's a, a hut or a skyscraper. It should, what I'm trying to say is that it must and should engage with season, with nature, rather than to fight them. Just like the way that we should eat food that is seasonal rather than import foods from another country to add carbon footprint and food miles to your food that is not seasonal in your, the area that you live, architecture should do the same. It should really respect and play ball and actually collaborate with nature. Change is frightening, we all know that. But the life-giving benefits of keeping connected with the seasons, weather, and nature always outweighs any worries. Resilient landscape is an ongoing gradual act. It evokes, I think, what I find interesting about engaging with seasons, if the building engages, it actually evokes tomorrow. It's eternal forward-looking. It invites plans and ambitions, creativity, and of course, expectation of something good to come. Thank you very much. Do now. Have any questions for Professor Lim? Okay, so we could get a mic. There's the gentleman in the purple shirt. I think it's purple at least. Sorry if I'm a bit colorblind. Perfect, thank you. When you were saying... Please stand up. Um, when you were saying how architecture should go well with the season. So like uh, how in spring it would be a different color, but how in summer it would be a different color. Is this better? Okay, so you were saying how architecture uh, should go well with the seasons, yes? Uh, okay, but my, I was confused a bit. You're saying that it would change over time, so from spring to summer it would change color, or you're saying that you'd build it, but it would stay the same color? I'm posing a possibility to you that we need to consider an innovate architecture that would actually go with the seasons, not just in terms of color, but also it could change size and form and so forth. I mean, I'll give you a very ancient example, for example. For the nomadic population of Mongolia, for example, they could take the architecture to different locations depending on the pasture that their sheep and goat and, and, and horses would feed on. And also the layers on the building, they use these sort of um, almost like quilt to cover that, that their earth, right, the tent. When it's Summer and spring, they would have less layers on them. They would actually, so the layers would reduce in size itself. And the things that, that's really, really interesting. So the thing that depending on the, the, the seasons, they would move it to different location. They would actually have less layers on the structure so that they could breathe because it's, you know, it's hot. Uh, and when winter comes, they would put more layers of duvet, this sort of, fabric over the top of it. I mean, that's just a very simple example um, of, you know, on that scale. On a sort of, you know, smaller scale, a more domestic scale, if uh, one of Le Corbusier's collaborators, uh, Eileen Gray, she actually did a house, which is a very beautiful house, um, which is not as well known, obviously, as Corbusier's work. But this house has a wardrobe, which is really interesting. 
In winter, the wardrobe could extend because she has lots of thick wool and fur coats inside it. And come summer, she would take the fur coats and the wool coats out and have thinner jackets and dresses and so forth, which means that the wardrobe could shrink. So these are just some examples that it could be done um, if we put our minds to it from different scales of communities moving their houses to actually domestically, you can change the scale of things around internally as well. So, but I hope that, you know, I don't have all the answers. I hope your generation and others after you would be able to think about it. And maybe that's one way of resilience and sustainability in terms of the built environment, because we cannot keep building, you know, concrete structures and steel structures with lots of glass, you know, all around it forever, because it's not sustainable, you know. And in a way, despite I was boiling hot when I came to this room, I'm really thankful that, you know, us together today collectively have not switched on the air conditioning in this room. You know, we are actually, you know, at least we've got, we got some fans, but we are using sort of natural ventilation to come in. And I think we need to take in all sort of initiatives to work with the environment, work, you know, in a kind of positive way. So does, does it sort of answer your question? Kind of, in a way, but using the example of nomadic M Mongolian houses, in my opinion at least, I don't think it's a good thing to compare with since we're in the Industrial Revolution at this very moment. You see, the Mongolian houses was a thing before the whole world was in communication with each other. This was the time when not even the Romans could communicate with the ancient Chinese. But I think, you know, maybe then we should also change our mindsets about land ownership and property ownership. We should change leg legislations about where we can build and where we can't build and what sort of things we build. I think we human beings have become collectively as in the world, not individuals. We have become so territorial that we say, this is mine, you cannot come into my house. So the thing is that if we change that mindset, you know, and be much more open to a different kind of collective living rather than saying, this is my space, maybe that would come into the equation. But I couldn't give you a solution to everything, yeah? Uh, but, you know, what we mustn't do is that we mustn't build a wall like President Trump, you know, and try to insulate and make America completely devoid of the rest of the world. Um, and I think that would be terrible. And I mean it metaphorically. Do we have any more questions? Yes. Um, first of all, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, it's exactly what we need to be talking about right now, the way we build cities, the way we look at the world. Um, and yes, there's a lot to learn from nomadic cultures and indigenous cultures as well. So I think we should be looking towards them to learn how to build our future. Um, one thing I was thinking about throughout your presentation um, which you latched on to at the end about the way we consume food, um, was whether within this idea, your conceptualization of these smart cities, um, whether you are also thinking about the whole cycle, the whole ecology of consumption and production. So food is one thing that's very important. I mean, you mentioned Cadbury before and Round Trees, which are two companies who are remolding our bodies through sugar and fueling disease, you know? So even if they're doing extremely excellent architectural pro uh, projects, what they are selling is changing us and changing our perception of the world in a drastic and very negative way. Um, so, and within this whole cycle, of course, there's other aspects. I mean, if it would be great to have one of these cities, but also if you have a supermarket that's, you know, completely stocked with products which go against these same principles and the same thing can go for the building materials that are used, the way we produce art also, the way we produce everything, the way we even function um, within a, a whole ecosystem, within like labor, social class, of course, and all of these elements. Um, I know this is, it's, it's a big burden to think about, you know, and obviously it's not only architects who can solve all of this, but are these points being taken into consideration within your designs and conceptualizations of smart cities? Thank you for the question. Um, as I say, I don't have the solution for everything, but the thing is that, you know, I actually think that I have to say, the initiative by Cadbury and Roundtrees, they were done in the 50s. This is a long time ago, when workers do not have much say in their working environment. So 
there was progress made by, by producing landscape where they could actually uh, have their lunch, for example. We are very privileged now. We have you know, buildings that is next to parks or squares, or we can actually have more conducive spaces where we can have lunches and things like that. In the old days, if you work in a factory, you work in a factory. And so I think that's to contextualize one part of it. The other thing is that you know, there are many companies that also produce not so healthy things, um, but also supermarkets that actually are agents of that sort of not so healthy lifestyle sometimes. And they are also very lazy because they actually um, can track what we buy and we actually, you know, they would also reduce and kill off certain vegetables, for example, um, that is more expensive to, for them to buy from farmers and things like that so that they, they would contain and reduce our range of consumption. Uh, I think they are guilty of all those things. But we can make choices. We have a say. You have a say, I have a say. For example, I do not buy berries, you know, raspberries, strawberries, wherever, in January and February. I was saying to my friends this morning, you know, I absolutely do not buy it. But I'm only one. If all 150 of you today, from now on, do not buy strawberries and raspberries in January and February, it will make a difference. If the whole Malta do not buy supermarkets do not buy that, or you, whole motor don't buy it, then your supermarkets will stop importing strawberries from countries that produce them in January and February, yeah? So I think we all have a choice. We can make these choices, you know? We can make choices that would change the future. And I think our voices are very powerful. I mean, the things that we need to do, if you think about all the people that sacrifice their lives, like Chico Mendes, for example, you know? They did it not because it would solve the problem immediately, but it actually have infiltrated and influenced our mindset and what is right and what's wrong about our environment. And I think that we can do the same thing with, with the way that we make choices about our food, yeah? You should read my, 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 my book, Food Cities. And thank you for the question. Any more questions? Yeah, the lady here. Yes. Thank you for the questions. I'm really excited to take these questions that you guys actually thought it was worth listening to. Yes, it was really interesting. Thank um, you. In a lot of these like amazing projects, sorry, sorry. Um, in a lot of these like <laughs> really cool projects that you mentioned, you're doing a lot of amazing things, but you also spoke about compromise and negotiation and uh, sort of inferred that there are battles lost in those projects. And I find that really interesting because any practicing architect or artist or anyone knows that it's a series of battles which you win and which you lose. And I was wondering if you could share more about your experience, because I'm sure you dealt with it a lot, about what maybe you have learned or any skills or tactics that you find um, useful. I think, work, work, thank you for your question. I don't have sort of wisdom to really tell you that, you know, you say, oh my God, that's really, I'm sure, Architects and planners and anybody in the design field are really aware of these things. You know, you have 10 things you want to do. And then if you're lucky, you can do one of the 10. That's pretty good going, yeah? The percentage is very good already. My lesson I learned from when I'm working with chi in China with the government was that, you know, stage one, I produce 10 ideas. And then stage two, I produce 15 ideas. And the people said to me, can I whisper something to you? You know, the, the, the people of power. To convince us the project is worthwhile doing, don't bring 15 next time, bring three in the second stage. If you bring 15 rather than five more than the first stage, the project will definitely be canned. So I think that's one thing. But I think, you know, I have been in the profession, I'm very old, by the way, I'm probably, you know, 120 years old, you know, and, but as I always say, I have a very good painting in my attic, um, AKA Dorian Gray. So the things that, you know, I think what I learned is that it's, for me, it's worthwhile fighting. It's worthwhile pursuing. And worthwhile saying, it doesn't matter how many knocks you get, if you believe in 
the future. You believe that you as an architect or a designer of the built environment can contribute. You need to keep fighting. I know it's easier said than done. And trust me, you know, in my ripe old age, there are days that I just think, why am I doing this? I might as well just sit and dream of my living by the country inside home, you know. But you are very young. I hope you and your generation will keep fighting because that's why I was, I was very keen to tell you stories about these sort of activists that have sacrificed their lives for what they believe is correct, what they believe not just in their own country, but how it would influence the world and our resilience towards climate change. You know, we cannot keep deforesta deforestation going on and on for, for, for cattle and for soybean. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, yes. that's... I'm very excited to hear all this. I'm a visitor and I had this great opportunity. But I have a question that may sound ridiculous, but I saw your plans and they're amazing. Are they only in the imagination or have any of them been partially executed? Thank you. The experimental thoughts and the recommendations to cities, for example, and to governments are probably more important than the real executed project because the things that at least the, the mindset could be changed and it would spread much faster than just saying there's one project there that is done in the right way. And I think, you know, I love China. China is a big city, but the things that, you know, they must keep the built environment under control. If money and finance take over, they will wipe out half the kind of, you know, of nature of the world. I mean, the, the things that they're developing so fast, industrialization is a big, big thing there. So, so I hope some of my thoughts, my recommendations will be, you know, infiltrate for many generations to come. I mean, it sounds pompous, but. Thank you. I hope you can get to the American governments and cities <laughs> to implement some of these ideas and then in a small way. But thank you very much for your question. <laughs> thank you. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. It was, at least to say, ins inspiring. Uh, such, I, such, such ideas are uh, worth putting them on the table because they fuel seeds for our thoughts and for future planning. My question is um, about greenwashing. So in your plans, how do you avoid your good ideas to end up being used as green, greenwashing? That's a major problem, greenwashing by all practices. Um, not so long ago, um, quite recently actually, um, I was part of the jury panel for a very huge piece of development um, and in China. And the thing is that there were 10 international, incredibly well-known practices that made submissions for it. And all of them did exactly what it did. They greenwash it. So the, the, you know, all the plans, all the drawings, all the proposals have different shades of green on it. And when you ask them, what exactly does that green mean? They couldn't tell you. <laughs> you know, I think one has to understand the specificity and the contribution of each flora species. You know, it has to understand the weather condition, the location, the, the history, the, her the, the floral heritage of the place. There are lots of consideration. Whereas, you know, my criticism about those 10 schemes, which I've, I actually, the, the recommendation was not to choose any of them as a winner for, to implement, was that they didn't know what the plans were. They just greened the bloody drawings. And you just think, no, 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 this is, no good, this is not good enough. And I think, you know, the idea of horticulture and gardening and landscape is much, much more sophisticated and complicated than people give it credit for. And I think, you know, it's really important that specific things has to be preserved. I mean, the things that, you know, to you and I, probably the baobab trees in Africa doesn't mean anything to us living in Europe, you know, or at least. And, but that's part of the legacy. That's part of the kind of, the symbol of survival in very harsh areas. The acacia trees are the same thing. So the things that, you know, there are things that 
we need to preserve and be aware of for practical reasons, but there are also things that we need to preserve as heritage and legacy, and to humanity, if anything. So I think for, for all those people, the, the, the authorities, the people who have money, when they actually see any green on, on the project that anybody proposes to you, interrogate them to see if there's a real McCoy. You know, otherwise, I think it's, it's not worth doing. Hi. So it was really inspiring. Yeah, it was really inspiring. So we have a Thank few you. plans in the, in the EU. So we have the net zero plans. We have the building standards for the construction where very passive actions for the houses have been taken in consideration. But still, the mindsets that we have, for example, in the EU is very different when we go from the north of Europe for, from the, the Netherlands and then Mark said when we actually come here. So how do you think that we can best influence the authorities to have a change? Because I'm, I, I work in the, in the sector of, of energy and water and I see the reality that it's, be, it's still being pretty conservative. But if we correlate that to the EU plans of being, of being carbon neutral, neutral the, the transformation has to be quite rapid. So, um, so how do you think we can best influence the, the authorities to, to have this rapid change which is needed? I think you need to not, I, I think, you know, again, my lessons, as uh, this lady asked me, is that not to be, not to patronize the authorities, not to patronize the government and say, you know, you should do this, you should do that. But you should just have conversations about, bring awareness that, for example, in your city, your country, you have plenty of energy. You have a lot of sunlight. You have a lot, you have water, you have sea wind, you have tidal condition. You know, there are many things you can do if you start thinking about how you could collaborate with nature rather than to go against it. You know, I mean, the thing is that, you know, I think that would be my starting point whenever I do a project, whenever I talk about a project, whenever I critique a project, how have we engaged with nature? That's the most, most important. How have you engaged with the weather, for example? You know, I think the problem with the architecture is that we fight against it. We build shelter that actually stops rain from coming in, wind from blowing through it, you know, in, in the modern ones at least, not the sort of vernacular. But the things that, you know, I think if you start with that, you can't go wrong. And then you take it from there. I, and I think, you know, it's really, really important that we must, must engage and not fight because nature is much bigger than any of us here, uh, any nation, any individuals, any sort of government. So, you know, work with what you've got, but also think about how, don't say that this is how we have done it before, yeah? This, that would be a terrible thing to do. What could you do in the future? Even diets could change. If you think about sort of coastal areas, right? Rather than actually eating vegetables that's imported from a different continent altogether, could we think about sort of cultivating seaweed, you know, algae farms along the coast, which has great nutritional value? I mean, if you think about it, I always think that the Japanese, they lived to the age of 200 because, you know, because they eat a lot of sort of seaweed and the iodine level in there and all the kind of nutrition that comes with it is incredible. And so the things that, you know, we might stop eating certain food products that might be damaging to the environment, but yet replace it with other things which could be equally as delicious. You know, we need to also not change in a, I'm not promoting veganism or anything like that. I think we are all free to eat whatever we want to eat, but I think if we want to contribute as the, a collective, we want to maybe change the way we live, the way that we play, the way that we actually travel, the way that we actually, um, you know, consume, the way that we do all these things, yeah? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for very interesting presentation and answers. And yeah, I think my question related with the same topic of our actions, how we can uh, start this journey of being more aware. 
And for example, probably you saw that there is a lot of ongoing constructions in Malta going on, and we have a lot of buildings here. And so how we can improve already a, a, approved plans of constructions. And for example, authorities often prefer build two second, two more layers, for example, instead of green roof. Or also if we decided to act, like to help make building more green, like to plant some grasses or flowers to attract bees, for example, might authority said, oh, you're doing great by yourself. We won't take any actions to help you. You can plant, like you can make your own gardens and attract different animals, but we won't help you in the future. So it will be on your side. How you work for the local authority, the government? I Me? Mean, no. <laughs> Okay, I think you cannot just plant a bit of grass or flowers, yeah? It needs to be very specific. I think, in a way, you, the authorities also have to trust the intelligence of the project as well, rather than actually add layers to the bureaucracy of it. I think that's one thing. I mean, there must be a fine balance between, you know, the different rules and regulations that one had. I mean, my God, you know, if you take my country, for example, in the United Kingdom, you know, it, it's terrible. We have so much bureaucracy that, you know, you just think, oh, I don't know how buildings get built. You know, everything has to be preserved. I mean, the things that at least you have buildings that you, you use, historical buildings, there we cannot even breathe on it, right? So everything has to be preserved. And, and so I think rather than adding to the layers of bureaucracy, we need to bring general awareness to not just the authorities, but the community. You need to bring the community ag along with you, the city with you, the citizens with you. And so that, you know, the, this kind of knowledge of resilience is not an elite knowledge. So the things that is not, oh, because you're in charge, you have this knowledge. Everybody has this knowledge and everybody should be aware of these things. Everybody has to say. So the things that, if that's the case, that everybody is conscious of what is good what is sustainable, what is resilient, then maybe the rules could be less bureaucratic, yeah? And I think that will be really, really important. I don't want to be told what to do all the time, yeah? That's really, really important. And I think, you know, it should not breed an elite power base. And I think that's really important. Thank you. We have time for just one more question, if anyone would like to add. The lady at the back. Yes. Yeah. Could, could you come forward? Yes, I can. Have you been standing all the time? No, I just, I get bored sitting down. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, thank you for telling me you got bored with me. No, not you, just my body. <laughs> um, I want to applaud you on all the good work you're doing as well, because it's very, I come from a different field. I'm a biologist. So um, it's very nice um, to see uh, this kind of integration and interconnection of different fields coming together. What I wanted to ask you was, on the point that the gentleman brought forward was being able to implement these things. What support do you find and how do you manage to do it? I'm studying sustainable development, which involves economy, society and the environment. But it's very hard to convince, as you said, when someone wants to build a skyscraper or something which is going to make them billions. Rather, how do you pitch the idea of this and how do you find the support to do it? I think for me, right, because most of the time I have this consultation role, role which means that, you know, my voice is more powerful than those who are desperate to build. Yeah. Good. And I'm pro because this is going to be broadcast, probably I'll stop, being, stop getting jobs in China. Uh, <laughs> but the things that, you know, they have been really receptive towards my recommendations. That's really good. And because they don't see that I have a direct financial benefit from it. And I think sometimes to be the king maker is more powerful than the king himself yeah? or the queen herself. Yeah. And, and the thing is that, you know, that's my position. And so I think I don't have, you know, it comes back to the, the question that Agnes Dennis in the wheat field in Manhattan comes to. Do you want the $93 or the billions that come with development on that piece of land in central Manhattan? You know, I'm sold, but yeah. yeah. The other people so the are. things that, I don't have the answer for that, unfortunately. Yeah, it's hard, yeah. it's hard. Yeah. I know. It's I know. a hard question. It's just... And the thing is that, you know, sometimes, you know, 
also the development might not be for uh, commercial use. They might be for social housing, for yeah. example. But then you should say every, you know, for social housing, you should have at least one third of the... Um, well, the this, benefits are infinite. I can, yeah, the, I can. You know, you can have one third of it for, for yeah. planting specific things, not just grass or roses, right? It has to grow food. It has to for food production. I support you in, yeah. in killing grass. Yeah. <laughs> because it's not a, uh, something that sustains biodiversity. We, so I know, but the things that we cannot afford it anymore. Okay. I mean, the things that, you know, we are in an age we cannot afford to have grass, you know, especially, again, no um, disrespect towards American lawn. Uh, yeah. You know, the They're American changing. lawn. They're changing slowly. The American lawn in California, when I go to, to, to Los Angeles, in the, the, the rich suburbs, they have sprinklers going on where yeah, you have water constantly. shortage there. Yeah. I which is like, please, please stop. This is terrible. You know, you it's must It's only stop. when it gets so bad that they have like laws saying yeah, not to do it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And the things that, you know, so I think coming back to my point is that we, we could only persevere, as I said to this lady here, we, we could only keep going and maybe over time. I mean, I remember yeah, I when I was a student, uh, uh, two millenniums, three millenniums, 300 millenniums ago, <laughs> and the thing is that, you know, um, the thing is, nobody knew the word sustainability. They know the word carbon footprint yeah. has not been invented. You know, none of these things actually came to anybody's awareness. But now it has come to the forefront. And I think, you know, this idea of diversity, sustainability, resilience, and so forth, has slowly permeated into our system, into our consciousness, into our awareness, in the way that we do things, in the way that we build, the way we design, we talk about design. And, we, you know, and these things actually matters to democracy and equality as exactly. well. Yeah. And so the things that these things really, really was, will be slow. And just like the people that planted the, RL, the, in, uh, the, the trees in the RLC, mm -hmm. you probably wouldn't see the big effect in your lifetime but maybe your children and grandchildren might benefit from it. And I think we could only live in hope. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, on that note, maybe I should end with, I hope, I wish, my desire is that we all could live in hope that the future would be better. Uh, and yet we might not see it in our lifetimes. It doesn't matter. But the things that we keep persevering, maybe. we probably will get there. Otherwise, you know, if we say, we we give up too easily, then it will be terrible. And it's, I'm so honored that you, in your profession, came to see me. I'm lucky because I, I get to sneak into these places. No, it's wonderful to have <laughs> a biologist to come today. I'm so honored. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Professor CJ Lim, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, everybody, for coming. So thank you to Professor Lim and thank you to those of you in the audience who posed their questions. That is exactly why we have these conferences. But we'd like to move on to another keynote speaker, who is Dr. Mario Balzan, a senior lecturer at the Malta College of Arts, Science and Technology and founder of Ecostack Innovations. Among other things, Dr. Balzan has also served as a scientific expert to the European Commission on projects that assess biodiversity and ecosystem services. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Mario Balzan. Good morning. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Amikas for the invitation. Uh, it's an honor to be here, it's a privilege. I'd like to start also by thanking um, Ms. Uh, Muscat, Dr. Portelli, the Education Committee. It's really uh, a pleasure to be here. But I'm also, I also happen to be a biologist. Um, I'm an ecologist. So I hope to bring a different perspective. I, I see many opportunities for uh, building on what Pro Professor Lim was saying and, and making and building synergies, actually. Um, I'm going to focus on some recent works uh, that we have carried out. Uh, maybe the presentation, please. Um, okay. Okay. And I'm going to talk about nature based solutions. And there I show two photos, two different extremes, if you want. Uh, well, of place we know well, uh, uh, Slima, St. Julian's, um, Sida, uh, our dense urban area, on which we have carried out significant research, and a quiet place in Valletta, not very far away from here, uh, the Valletta Design Cluster. Um, 
And, but before I go to this, I, Professor Lim reminded me of where I started. 13 years ago, as a 25-year-old uh, student, running around in Italy, I had the liberty of carrying out months of fieldwork in Tuscany, so not a, nice, not a very bad place. Um, and I was working with farmers. And uh, in these trials and the, and, and, and the work I was conducting, I was actually planting flowers in agricultural fields. And there, tomato is a big crop. So you, you stand here and you only see tomatoes red. It's a red sea, basically, um, for very, until very far away. And we were planting flowers in the crop. And we we're doing it to make the crop resilient to pests. But when we actually harvested uh, the crop, when we're looking at the results, we noticed that not only the crop was resilient to pests, but the crops close to the flowers had more fruit and larger fruit. And this is what I would like to speak about today, the benefits of nature. These are also familiar places. Um, and I'll share a lot of photos and, and uh, slides about Malta here. We have seen these photos in the news. Okay, green spaces, new green spaces, green walls. And there's a lot of interest in this nowadays. We want to have green spaces. We want to have green. We want to have nature. Well, because it leads to benefits. And the benefits who? to whom? To us, to human well-being. Well, you know, there's an aesthetic, the, the aesthetic, I mean, aesthetic value in seeing a nice landscape. Or the inspirational value for an artist, okay? Or, well, the cooling effect. Now we are in summer, um, and if you're walking under the shade of a tree, then that sort of has a pleasant effect. It reduces the temperature by a few degrees Celsius. But also, to biodiversity. I also enjoy the question about uh, bees and uh, pollinators. And, uh, well, we, there's a lot of interest in also protecting nature and ensuring nature now comes back to the city. We have tended to forget about nature. But there's a few questions, I think, that we have to ask. So the, this, before I go to the questions, actually, the idea now, these are the SDGs, which you are all familiar with, is that the biosphere is not only, we don't look at it at just mitigating the impacts, but it's also about how nature, the nature around us, can support society and the economy. And then the cycle goes back. So giving rise again to benefits to nature, which supports, again, the economy and society. But there's a few questions. Look at these interventions and ask yourself, are these interventions effective? Do they give rise to benefits to communities? I think they do in some cases, uh, in many cases. Do they give rise to biodiversity? I'm not sure there because we've never measured this. This was one of the problems, I would say. Are we prioritizing the most effective nature-based interventions? Could we do more with this space, with this budget, with these resources? I think these are key questions which we need to ask ourselves. In the first part of my presentation, I'll talk about our recent work on assessing these benefits. Um, this is where we are. We're in Valletta. You can see it's all built up around us. 30% um, of the land surface is more or less is urban. 50% uh, is agriculture, more or less, if I'm not mistaken. And we have a population density of more than 1,400 per square kilometers. A lot of my work has been in the uh, Grand Harbor area, so you know population density is much higher. Uh, so we ask ourselves these questions. Who is benefiting? Who is benefiting from nature? And is it multifunctional, like those flowers in, in, in an agricultural land, providing pollination, but also protecting the crop against, against pests. Is it multifunctional? Do we get more than one benefit? And who, are, who, is, who is getting these benefits? And I had the, I had the luck, I would say, of being funded uh, by many European projects for the last 10 years. And this is a result of one of the projects. Uh, it, it was, it's a Horizon project uh, funded by the European Commission, which was meant to help member states, in that case Malta, start to come up with what we call maps of ecosystem services and valuing the benefits from nature. And we start off from, I would say, close to zero. We had very limited data which was available, and we started mapping these values, these benefits that we get from nature. And so 
time passed and we realized that there is a rural urban gradient. When you go in the city, there's less what we call green infrastructure and we get less benefits from nature. And this gradient is really strong with our cities. You can walk outside of the city and then you have a nice agricultural landscape in many cases and you get many benefits. Aesthetics, improve their quality, um, some of the shade I was talking about, um, tourism in some cases as well. And there seems to be this link. So the first one is showing the capacity, the ability of our environment to provide us with these services and benefits. That increases with what we call green infrastructure. It's a linear relationship, but also then this green infrastructure is negatively associated with population density. I would say in places where you have 15,000 or 10,000 individuals per square kilometer is where you need nature most in many cases, right? So, but are they really, are our cities really cold spots of these services that we get from nature? It depends. It's a matter of perspective. If you look, we created a, um, a framework based on, based on previous literature. If you look at capacity, so how much we could theoretically get, then yes. But if you look at the flow, so how many people are using these spaces, how much these spaces are beneficial in terms of removing air pollutants, then it's not. Even if we have limited, uh, limited green spaces, you see on this map, this map is showing the removal of nitrogen dioxide gas from the atmosphere, which is an, a pollutant. It's more blue in our urban areas. Why? Because there's more pollution. So the effect there is stronger. You can remove much, much more pollutants, even if you have a limited space, a limited green space. This is another study that we did with a student of mine. We used uh, the app geocaching. It's a treasure hunt. So people hide these caches around Malta, around Europe, around the globe, and someone else goes to look them up, to find them. Um, and they can actually say, well, I found this treasure, and I enjoyed this experience. This is one of my favorite experiences. So you can really track who is going where, and if he is enjoying that experience or not. And this is one of the figures. It's the average number of favorite points per year. And you can see there that our urban green areas, despite maybe not being so big, uh, and maybe there's room for improvement in the structure, are actually the most favored. Okay, so why am I saying this? It's because our cities maybe don't have so much nature, but what we have is very, very important. This is a study which is right now in publication. We used two apps, uh, Flickr, I think you are familiar with Flickr, it's becoming less important nowadays, replaced with Instagram and, and other social media. But until recently, it was huge, and you can find millions of photos on Flickr. Um, and iNaturalist, uh, those of you who are uh, a bit of nerds in terms of ecological stuff like I am, know that you can go to a place, take a photo on your phone of a bee or of a grasshopper of a plant, take, upload it on the app, and it will tell you what species more or less it is. So we collected this data from Flickr and iNaturalist. For Flickr, we collected around, I think, 40 to 50,000 photos from Malta. There was a process of uh, automation, so selecting only photos related to nature and site visitation. And actually, we are able to show where are the hotspots of where people are going for nature-based recreation or nature-based tourism. And you see that Valletta actually is not doing very badly and Slima and Xira and, and, and Pembroke and so on. So actually we find that living close to cities is important. You also see the kind of experience. So the, 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 the map with the green and blue and pink dots is actually showing different types of photos, what people are actually recording. Uh, so you see in inland, more inland, there's a lot of photos of plants, but around, of course, the coast is more sea, the coastal environment. So what, what am I saying here? That there's benefits in conserving all these different types of nature that we have around us. And this is a bit of a more complex figure, but it's like a map. We try to look at where the photos from Flickr and the points on our natural stand when you consider the environmental factors. I'm not sure you're seeing this. But if, you see, if you're seeing this, you're seeing that the, the, the arrows for Flickr and iNaturalist are very close to the road network, to the population size, to the social variables. Why? Because in many cases, we see that 
you access nature if you have access to it, you're close to it. There are roads leading to that. Of course, there are, there are trade-offs which you may have with nature conservation there, which we, uh, which we need to tackle. Moving on, cities. The Grand Harbor, this is the Northern Harbor and the Southern Harbor local plans. Some years ago, I was collaborating with the planning authority in a project funded by the European Commission, and we started mapping these services. Well, first of all, we mapped the green infrastructure. We mapped all the green spaces, even if it's private, public, anything is green, anything has some form of green, at the time we mapped it. Um, we categorized everything, we looked at soil sealing, we looked at recover. The, the, the figure at the bottom, bottom left, I would say, probably on your end, is uh, very white. That's very much showing a lack of any tree cover in our cities. And amongst other things, we looked at the, at the relationship between some of the benefits with tree cover. And here we show regulating benefits, so noise abatement, uh, so slowing down the, the flow of noise in cities, or climate regulation, the local reducing the temperature in summer, for example, and so on. And we find a very strong relationship with tree cover. Okay, so it's very linear, very strong. Tree cover is very important in our city, in our cities. And this is only for what we call regulating. So how nature regulates. The, env the environment in our cities. We also found that, so we created an index, it's called the Index of Effectiveness. This is all published and all public knowledge. And we found that private gardens are four times more effective than public gardens at providing these benefits. So then the question is, let's skip this, who benefits? Who benefits from nature? If private gardens are more effective than your public green space, and probably if you are well off, more well off, if you have a degree, if you are in a managerial position, you have more access to nature. And this is what this figure is showing. The blue means you are far away from nature, far away from nature that gives you some benefit. The red means you are closer, okay? If you have tertiary education, if you, have if you are in the professional managers category, you tend to be close to nature, which provides you with a number of benefits. And this is independent of population density. So population density is also another factor, separately. It, 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 it leads to um, increasing distance from uh, certain benefits. But if you are with illness, unemployed, in elementary occupation, with disability, you tend to live further away from nature, at least in Malta, uh, further away from nature, that is effective in providing you with benefits, okay? And this is an important aspect for me. This shows that greening is not just about greening, it's not just about the plants, it's also a social issue, it's also an economic issue. Um, and here we're looking just at one aspect. This is what we call the distributive justice. We could also talk about procedural justice. That is how we plan our green spaces or their interactional, the opportunities for interactions within the, these green spaces. More recently, more recently, uh, the term nature-based solutions started to come up a lot in policy. First European policy as often happens and then it trickles down to national policies. Um, there's this very nice framework by the IUCN. It's the use of nature. So what are nature-based solutions? In simple words is, the use of nature to address certain challenges. The, cer the challenges are those shown in the circles there, okay? Climate change, disasters, natural disasters, food and water security, which was very much mentioned earlier on. All of this was very much mentioned. Health, okay? Um, jobs and so on, okay? How can we address these challenges through nature, okay? Through nature. Um, and by doing so, a nature-based solution should give rise to benefits to human well-being, but also to biodiversity. So nature-based solutions could look like this. These are not my photos, because they give us a number of benefits. They give us clean air, they give us food, they give us water, they give us opportunity for recreation, they reduce noise in our cities, and so on and so forth. They are shown in this figure here. So, I was coordinating a Horizon 2020 project called Renature until a few 
months ago. And well, we, we wanted to ask we wanted to ask people for their examples of nature-based solutions and created an atlas, a compendium, a repository, whatever you like. And we asked, so we received around around 100 submissions, first from Malta, and then we opened it for other Mediterranean climate case studies. And we asked people, well, how are you using, wh why are you using these nature-based solutions? Which challenges are you trying to tackle through nature-based solutions? I'm showing here just the data for Malta, but there's another heat map like this for the whole compendium. This is also published work. And we found that actually in Malta, we tend to focus a lot on our natural areas. And we often tackle biodiversity loss, ecosystem degradation, uh, the lack of knowledge, heat risk and droughts. But the rest of the figure here is mostly yellow. And this shows that we don't have much case studies there. It could be because our data set is limited. It could be because we don't have so much experience here. Which are the benefits that you saw? And again, experience is very biased. We just focus, we have been focusing a lot on natural areas management, landscapes, rural areas. The cities, the green spaces, maybe we're not seeing them as nature-based solutions. Which are the SDGs you are tackling? Remember the figure with, from the SDGs? A lot of yellow there as well. When we should be talking about nature as being multifunctional, as giving rise to so many different benefits, as giving rise to so many benefits in terms of these different SDGs. And, well, what is stopping you? What is enabling your work? And this is another study that we did, published recently. Uh, it's based on interviews with stakeholders from planning, environment, water, energy, uh, different sectors, and also businesses. And we asked them, well, what is an enabler? What is a barrier for your uptake of nature-based solutions? If you see a cross, that's a barrier. We actually categorized everything in terms of perception, institutions or infrastructure. This is a framework that we use, I'm not going to go into it, but in terms of perception, it's not showing up really well here, but in terms of perception, you see there's a lot of barriers. People might not be fully aware of the alternatives or the benefits, or the developer might not be very much aware, or there, is, there isn't a, a process of co-creation of the involvement of communities that Professor Lim was, was mentioning before me. And often, we think of our green spaces as being high-cost alternatives to, I don't know, some pavemented square, for example. In terms of institutions, there are some enablers here uh, and also some barriers. So we don't have enough understanding of the costs and the benefits, as I was saying. Our institutions have limited capacity. This is normal. This is not just for Malta, but maybe a bit worsened by the fact that we are a small island state. Okay the lack of interdisciplinary approaches. So maybe often working across departments or across disciplines, the lack of national guidance or practical guidance. It's reversed if you go at regional scale. There's a lot of guidance coming from the EU or at Mediterranean scale, for example, by the IUCN, okay? Um, and you see also re realization, difficulty in establishing cooperation, lack of standards, lack of monitoring. So these are b barriers which continue to limit our uptake. A lot of barriers when it comes to infrastructure. Uh, limited space, so you're competing with land, uh, which has a value. Few positive examples, and therefore, you can't really use these previous experiences to inform new experiences. Need for better integration uh, of the principles into existing projects or terms of references. Finding a balance with culture, especially in a place like Valletta, okay, in a place which is historic. Um, working in a Mediterranean climate, a harsh climate where water is not available for months. So these are very much challenges that, that our community, our practitioners are finding. Addressing the challenges, this is the last part of my presentation. I'm just going to share with you a few experiences that I've had um, many cases participating in, in EU projects uh, where we try to address these challenges, which are not just related to nature itself, but also social, okay? Uh, in, in the previous presentation and in the, dis the discussion that followed, we mentioned transformation, working with nature. The transformation has not, it's not just ecological transformation. We need a social transformation as well. We need the technological transformation. And this is what we try to do. So someone mentioned bees. 
uh, well, which flowers do you put in a green space to attract bees, to conserve pollinators? This is a big, this is a big thing. In, in Europe, now there is something called the EU Pollinators Initiative, which has been going on for a few years. In a, in a, in a law which should be regulation, EU regulation, which is coming very soon, there's actually a target for the known at loss of pollinators by 2030 and their improvement by 2040 and 2050. So this is a big thing and also locally. So we've been studying visitation and we also have, we're, this is something we're establishing now. We're also funded by a Horizon Europe project where we're gonna, we're gonna um, use cameras that can actually detect certain species and automatically identify everything. Um, and uh, everything is, is gonna be sort of remotely done but also involving citizen scientists. So we're working with natural history museums in the Netherlands, for example, Naturalis, which have developed uh, apps, which have developed image recognition. So you are somewhere, you take a photo, you send it to us, and you know we're able to identify that species for you, and you'll be contributing to our national records on biodiversity. Also, nature-based solutions. So remember, nature-based solutions give rise to benefits to biodiversity, but also to well-being. That's a couple of slides about biodiversity, but let's go back to well-being. Uh, this is a collaboration with the University of Trento in Italy, and this is led by uh, a PhD student who I was working with, uh, Davide Longato. Um, well, you can't see this for sure, but through this paper, through this study, we looked at the supply of these services, the benefits that we get from nature. Then we mapped the demand. Where do you need them? Who is demanding? Who needs these benefits? Noise abatement, air quality improvement, um, runoff regulation, climate regulation. And then, based on these maps and data, we could actually say, well, here is what you should focus on. This is the green space that you have available, and this is what is more effective here, based on what is the structure of the, the, the green space, most likely, and also the demand for that service. So this is a map of priorities where our authorities should focus to give rise to benefits to communities. I, I mentioned renaturing is a social innovation. I'll, I'll say a few words about the project that I was coordinating. Oh, I'm not sure I can, but... Okay, uh, this was a project, I'll go back. Something has moved here, um, where we were focusing on capacity building. We trained around 500 students from across the globe, with 32 trainers from across the globe as well. Um, and we created a network of people, I think, which was coming for training activities. And at the same time, using these apps, using these technologies, communicating. I think it's also, if you want to talk about nature-based solutions and greening and renaturing, then it's also about building the capacity. And I'll, I, I can't show you much here. Um, this was a cycle of data collection, of knowledge synthesis, seeing where the gaps are, some of the slides I presented already, in terms of what is limiting the uptake of nature-based solutions, sharing experiences, uh, what has been working, what, where we have the gaps. And this was a cycle. So we trained students in universities, PhD students, master students, but also we asked our stakeholders from environment, planning, energy, as I was mentioning before, and I, we invited them for training activities, which were uh, run by local and international experts. Actually, you have the numbers here. So uh, we trained, I would say, around 500 participants, and we had created a 65 a stakeholders network of 65 stakeholders who were all the time joining us for events. Another example, this was another project we coordinated, it's called Recreate. It's a small project in Isla with University of Malta, with the Isla Local Council. Uh, we try to monitor biodiversity within Isla using apps. Uh, we had tree planting activities. We created a pop-up park in a square, which was just tiles, I would say. And if you go there today, it's still there. So it's a pop-up. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be there right now. It's still there because it's very much enjoyed. And actually, I was on Facebook last week, and I noticed actually children dancing around and playing for the school. So it's, maybe we did something positive here. Uh, we, we, we have infiltrated infuse some nature in a very dense city, and it's a space that people can use. And this gave rise uh, with our collaborators to a nice booklet, which you can download from here, 
um, about our experience, how to engage citizen scientists, how to engage the communities. Um, it's not perfect. It's a, small, it's a short experience, it's a small project, but it's a start. I think it's about experiences and about sharing experiences. Conclusions. Um, when we talk about greening, we need to talk about the benefits to nature itself, to biodiversity. We're not doing that, unfortunately, I would say. We need to talk about the benefits to well-being. We're doing that, but sometimes we think about just the aesthetics or the recreational value. There's more to nature. And I think we need to understand these benefits in more detail to actually improve our greening strategies and practices. And also, so therefore dealing to well-being. There's key challenges. We have identified key challenges, but also opportunities. I think there's opportunity in innovation, in collaboration, and this is what we should be doing right now. Uh, engaging communities. I think I've, I've been very happy to learn about MICAS and the work we're planning to do and other projects. And I think this is sort of what we should be thinking about doing right now. Building the capacity for communities to recreate, to renature their green spaces. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Balsan. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask Dr. Balsan? Um, Bonjour. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I don't know if this is a question or a comment, but my, what I cannot really understand is why we use the word nature. Because the way I experience life, I feel like I am part of nature. I feel like concrete is part of nature. I feel like the buildings are part of nature. The issue is that we have separated ourselves from nature. And if we study indigenous communities that haven't been uh, brainwashed in ways of thinking, like that may be, I don't know, I, again, these are ideas that I'm having right now, but like, I think we've separated ourselves from nature because of indoctrinations from Christianity, for instance, we've put ourselves above nature. So I have issues when, with, I have issues with the word nature and how we talk about it. We are nature. And therefore, I think we just have to understand that we are the environment that we live in. And instead of, like, it's, it's about changing perspectives. And I think it's, uh, it's changing perspective at a higher level than accepting the reality that we're in right now and realize that we are the environment and that it's like nature has no issues. If we die, nature will survive. And we have to re remember that we are nature and like act within that notion, I think. So I don't know about like EU policies and all re-naturing and na, 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 na. Uh, to me it feels very, it sounds bizarre. And I don't know like what's the origin of such separation. Yeah, I don't know if it's a question or yeah. How would you, how would you rephrase it? I don't know, and I have no solutions, and I don't think we should have answers. Yeah. But no. I, I, we're here to share ideas and like question things, and I, that's, that's my issue. I'm just yeah. voicing no. this, this dissonance I see in our own language. So I, I agree with you, but I think we are part of nature. So when I say nature, don't take it as death is nature, and this is us. We are part of nature, and this also, I use terms like ecosystem services. And uh, recently, 2019, I think, this was a big debate. So you, it's a very valid point, and I take it. Uh, and actually, there was there's an intergovernmental panel uh, working at global scale. And they didn't like the term ecosystem services for the same reason you were mentioning, saying indigenous communities are inherently part of nature. We, the Western world, often think of nature as a spot for recreation. So what are the benefits you get from nature? I do it with my students. I'm talking about benefits and service and so on. But what, what, why is not nature useful to you? And I think some of them, well, a few of them struggle for the first five minutes. And they mention recreation and, oh yes, aesthetics. And we, in the Western world, we do. Um, I think I, my definition of nature is us being part of nature. And I like, the new terminology, nature-based solutions. It's a solution for nature itself, okay? Giving rise to benefits to nature in terms of species, in terms of nature rewilding our cities, if you want, okay? But also giving rise to benefits to us. So I don't see this distinction. I see benefits to us. It's a very 
extrinsic view of nature, yes, but we're also seeing that we could actually give rise to benefits to nature itself by changing the way we work. By instead of thinking of tackling water management only by gray infrastructure or engineering approaches, now looking at it also from a point of view of nature. How can you use nature, so it's still extrinsic, don't get me wrong, okay, but also give rise to some benefits to biodiversity in a place which has been, where nature has sort of uh, been replaced by our concrete and our buildings and our roads. Any more questions? Uh, hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting to learn even on the local scene, the uh, research and, and, and studies being, being, being done, even from an academic le level. Uh, I think for me, the most interesting slide you had on your presentation was the chart where it was plot, where you have plotted or the, your team plotted the uh, benefits versus the uh, financial income or the, uh, status or pro profession of citizens. So my question is going to be based uh, on, on that. Um, so um, have you extrapolated or furthered your, your studies to see whether those benefits also relate to health inequalities? No, we, ha we haven't. We haven't. Um... We work as a number, in a number of projects related to health, um, but we haven't done it for loc locally. One of the reasons is data availability. Data is there, don't get me wrong, but it's also about personal data and access to it, which is often uh, a bit complex and I think limits our work in that area. But I think it's, a, it's an area which we are working on. I mentioned a project which you see the logo of there, it's called Go Green Roots, so maybe have a look at it online. Uh, we are engaged as an environmental as the, uh, experts. So Go Green Roots is greening six routes in six cities. Uh, there's Bulgaz, Lati, Versailles in France, the three more. Um, and we are the scientific partner assessing the impact of this greening on biodiversity. But very much like us, there's experts the, who are from the health uh, field and they are uh, uh, asking people to wear sensors they're seeing how they engage with nature. They're asking them questions before and after they visit a space which have been uh, renatured or regreened, whatever. Um, so there's a lot of work which is going on at European scale. Unfortunately, I would say we haven't done that so far here. It's an area which requires uh, further work, especially given these inequalities which we think are there based on our data. We have time for another question. Uh, earlier in the first presentation by Professor Lim, we spoke a lot about hope and about looking forward, and you spoke quite a lot about barriers and um, overcoming barriers and challenges. In, in your view, I mean, culture, in my mind, is, is a big part of this. In your view, what are some of the, the key cultural, shall we say, rather than cultural obstacles to overcome, the key ways to engage with, with these challenges from a cultural perspective? I think today we, we, we're talking more of working across disciplines. And if you're just talking about nature, for me, learning about plants is a lot of fun. But maybe it's not for you. Maybe you're more into arts and culture. I think we have to think about it this way. For us experts or practitioners who are in the field, to think about it in this way. And there's a lot of work going on about, for example, linking nature, work in nature or restoration or rewilding to arts. If I can clarify my space. question, I'm not talking about culture from an arts and culture perspective, but from a, the culture, everyday cultures in okay. people, people culture and basically how that influences decisions that get taken. Well, I mean, for me, it's, we are in a stage where we are realizing that we need nature. And I think if you look at what happened in COVID, it's not a very... It's not a moment which has been, this may be three years, four years ago, I'm losing count of time. But I remember a time when we were all walking in the same green spaces and keeping our distances, right? So I think it's about communicating that importance and people realizing the benefits of nature. Um, 
It's happening all the time. I think we need to link to sports, for example. Going for a jog, instead of going jog for a jog in the city, um, at the risk of being hit by a car, maybe f having a route for a nice jog, for a nice walk, you know? So I think we need to link. This is also not just about art. We need to link to sports. We need to link to our medical practitioners. We need to link to arts, as I was saying before, and to transport. I think this is a way of doing it. And people will realize that if you work uh, from an office for eight hours, and maybe, and you have a nice route accessible, walking back home gives you some other benefits other than the avoided traffic, you know? So I think this is the kind of logic which I would, which I would think of, and I think which we need to work on. Thank you very much, Dr. Balsan, for your presentation. Thank you once again to those who posed their questions from the audience. The panel will be moderated by Mr. Konrad Pohacar, who is a founder of AP Valletta, who has lectured in a number of universities, including in Malta and in the United States. I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have Dr. Georgina Portelli, MICOS board member and chair of the Education Committee, Mr. Andrew Dara, Portugal and Garden Design Consultant, Mr. Anton Grek, Artist and Head of Department for Visual Arts within the Faculty for the Built Environment at the University of Malta, Mr. Stephen Saliba, Team Manager for the Environment and Resources Authority and Local Visual Artist, and last but definitely not least, Professor Elizabeth Conrad, Associate Professor and Coordinator for the Division of Environmental Management and Planning of the Institute of Earth Systems, and please welcome back Professor CJ. Lim. Mr. Bohajar, floor is yours. Enjoy. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, the idea is that um, every panel member will give us a 10-minute presentation, uh, following which we will have a discussion and questions afterwards. So I would like to introduce uh, Stephen, who will give us a presentation. No, no. I go oh, first. With Dr. Portelli, okay, it's the other way, I'm sorry. So Dr. Portelli will give us a presentation. As you know, Dr. Portelli is chairing the Education Committee and is uh, one of the, let's say, brains and hearts behind my case. What? Okay, so can I go up? Yes, you can, yes, you can. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Is this okay? Yes. Right. So, what I would like to do this morning, um, first of all, I think this morning's keynote speakers clearly conveyed nature's significance to society and the effectiveness of mainstreaming nature-based solutions to tackling societal challenges and sustainable urban development. The MICAS project, and that's what I would like to talk about, primarily focused on cultural infrastructure, aims to create a new art space by revitalizing a long neglected cultural heritage site through urban reclamation, by repurposing the historic landscape of the older Spezio site in the town of Floriana, restoring the bastions and developing new art galleries and a sculpture garden, the project will reclaim, reclaim approximately 7,000 square meters for public use within walking distance of Malta's capital city, Valletta, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The reclaimed and regenerated MICA site will provide the public with increased access to new heritage trails, green areas, open spaces, and long-hidden seascapes, integral elements interwoven into a rich urban tapestry of the Northern Harbour area. The core vision of MICAS revolves around creating a holistic and immersive multidisciplinary visual art experience that expands cultural participation and enhances well-being through encounters with contemporary art and nature. Today, I would like to introduce the MICAS Sculpture Garden, a green infrastructure project currently under development on the San Salvatore Counter Guard a soil-filled bastion hosting a generous pocket of green space, 
a meadow spanning around 2,600 square meters. From its inception, the sculpture garden has been an integral part of the Micah's vision, grounded in the understanding that as human beings, we are interconnected with the broader ecosystem and inherently drawn to nature, which is vital to our well-being. The vision for this green infrastructure, this is the counter guard and the meadow on it, um, the vision for this green infrastructure project evolves out of a conceptual framework that perceives the urban public garden as a human natural environment nexus with its own complexities and linkages. Our intention is to instill a consciousness towards natural environments by creating the conditions for such connecting nodes to take root. Embracing a socio-aesthetic perspective for such connecting, uh, sorry, embracing a socio-aesthetic perspective perspective, Mike strives to establish a new cultural ecology that promotes urban biodiversity and fosters placemaking through connections with nature, physical spaces, and contemporary art. The new garden will share borders with the neighboring wooded areas of the Kainetum, the Port de Bomb Bird Sanctuary, the Melorda Gardens in Pietà. Additionally, it is close to a network of about 15 historic gardens in our neighborhood. Additionally, um, sorry, within the dense urban context of the harbor area, uh, these gardens and green spaces act as crucial nodes that foster much needed connectivity between the natural, the social, and the material environments. Given its proximity to these protected ecosystems, MICAS will work closely with the Environment and Resource Authority, ERA, to ensure the utmost sustainability of its greening project. ERA has conducted an ecological survey and impact assessment of the San Salvatore County Guard to identify the range of flora already present on the soil terrace and its surrounding. Apart from the established native trees and flora, the site also hosts a lot of invasive non-native species. Therefore, the reclamation effort will also address the rehabilitation of habitats. Undoubtedly, the development of the sculpture garden will respect the historical significance of the San Salvatore County Guard Terrace, necessitating context-sensitive planting and landscaping to preserve the adjacent historic stonework. The site plan for the garden has been developed in collaboration with IFA Studio Architects, responsible for the overall design of the Micah's galleries and spaces, and Andrew Dara, a horticulturist and garden designer. Micah's is deeply passionate about its mission to establish meaningful connections with neighborhoods and communities. As a public cultural organization, its role is to facilitate access to art and democratize spaces to nurture inclusive social interaction. In this context, Micah's endeavors to foster an integrated organic corridor that connects with the overall historic landscape and the display of contemporary art. The sculpture garden will contribute significantly to a Micah's program that is fresh and varied in scope. It will, we hope, inspire artists to engage with it and the historic landscapes and harborscapes that will provide a rich backdrop to temporary hosting of contemporary art interventions. It will be vital in reconnecting visitors with endemic and indigenous habitats while fostering creativity. The garden will be instrumental in drawing visitors' attention to the significance of landscapes, seascapes, habitats, and ecosystems within our cultural sites. Recognizing the immense value of the historic landscape and the urban biodiversity, Micah carefully considers the greening of the sculpture garden and outdoor spaces. The vision is to establish and curate viable and sustainable indigenous and endemic ecosystems sensitive to the local context that will follow seasonal patterns of display. I will now pass on the floor to Andrew, our horticultural and garden design specialist, who will give more insight on the design of the garden. Hello, uh, my name is Andrew Dyer. I'm the garden consultant for the Micah Sculpture Garden and I've been asked to give a short introduction to the elements of the design. We very much knew from the, <clears throat> from the beginning of the project that we did not want a garden to be filled with a classic lawn or a parterre network of paths. We also knew, <clears throat> we also knew being located high on top of a counter guard overlooking the harbour of Pierre Terre, the growing conditions are going to be very exposed with extreme heat and a strong saline wind. 
To that end, the idea of only using Maltese indigenous flora, in particular those plants found on a coastal Greek landscape, for inspiration became more and more obvious to us to sustainably grow and maintain a modern garden. We also desired to have a flat landscape, similar to what a lawn would have given us, <clears throat> to be able to see the sculptures that might be placed. Low-growing plants found in a Greek landscape lends itself to this desire. Closely working with architects who designed <clears throat> the Micus building, we decided on a design... Hanky. <clears throat> Closely working with architects who designed the Micus building, we, de we decided on this design. An alluring network of plants giving visitors a feeling of exploring the garden, yet still having very large areas of planting. As you can see from this cross-section, it is on quite a large incline. So the first 18 or 20 meters, there is need for this zigzag path with a ramped incline to cater for the, the incline. In this part of the garden, I took inspiration from the Maltese dry stone walls to provide the much needed soil retention, whilst also providing seating similar to what you see in the picture and in the neighboring Malorda Gardens. This also creates a sheltered habitat for the flora and fauna to nestle in amongst the rubble walls. As this first part of the garden is going to be viewed from the cafe, I wanted to create a lush ground cover of indigenous plants using different textures of leaves, flower color, shape, and form to fill the four or five beds either side of the path, similar to the bottom right picture. The central top picture is a visual of what I'm thinking. The further you move away from the, guard, from the museum, the design elements lend itself to feel and look wilder, natural, and more relaxed in its style of planting. The pictures around the edge show some of the plants and the plant combinations I'd like to use in the garden. Using plants like native grasses to blow in the wind, <clears throat> thyme and acanthus, to name just a few. Naturally, we need to provide shade for, for us to enjoy the garden. We'd like to use some of the smaller indigenous trees planted towards the edge with more seating, as seen in the bottom. We've been in direct consultation with IRA, and naturally, we'd like to plant context-sensitive planting due to the historic fabric of the bastions. I think it's also good to mention at this point that due to the very nature of the garden, it's not going to be an instant finished display. Many of the plant specimens will be small or have to grow from seed. However, this is not a bad thing, as watching a garden develop and mature over time gives us the opportunity to mould and landscape the garden as it develops. It also means plants establish healthier and quicker. I wanted to leave us on this last slide, as <clears throat> the next but extremely exciting part is to draw up planting plants within the negative spaces you saw before. These are a few of my plant combinations that I've created after walking through the Maltese, land, Maltese countryside, where I naturally get my inspiration. These will aid my design and to be continued. Many thanks. Well done. And now I'd like to invite Anton to give his presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, today, I would like uh, to take you for a little trip to uh, Germany, to Neuss, uh, to speak of a success story that started in the 80s. Um, this gentleman here, Karl-Heinz Muller, was a estate agent and uh, very successful, who, when given the choice to buy a Porsche or a watercolor by Emil Nolde. Luckily for us, decided to buy the Emil Nolde. And that was the start of a art collection he then had to house. And he came up with this idea of creating a special space, um, which for us here, um, uh, thinking of how Micas will be in a couple of years, um, can be seen as a case study of how nature does its work when one gives it the opportunity. So um, we're going to go back um, to 
images when the project started in the 80s. What one has to note is that um, uh, Muller was very wise in choosing his collaborators. He um, worked with two professors from the Kunstakademie in Dusseldorf, namely a sculptor named Erwin Herisch and a painter named Gotthard Graupner, who happened to be my professor. I had spent 10 years in the Academy in Dusseldorf, and I was witness um, to this um, project and its cultural dimension. Um, we are seeing here um, the Museum Island, Hombroisch plan, and just to uh, make you understand that this whole area uh, was uh, potato fields. And um, the landscape architect Bernard Corte, rather than architect, um, landscape poet, I would say, managed to take the Erft, the river passing by, and recreate a landscape that was similar to how it was after the Ice Age. So um, uh, plants were important, trees were imported from Belgium to re-establish the type of environment that was uh, there before, and also several interventions were made to create uh, an, an, the basis for a natural environment. Um, the work of Erwin Herisch was to create art pavilions. So on the whole territory I am showing you here, um, here we have the first, the first interventions in the 80s, seeing that the whole environment was uh, industrial agricultural land. Um, uh, Muller himself inspecting the sites, and here on the right, one of the first buildings that were built, the so-called labyrinth that had the intention of creating a neutral um, artistic uh, space to exhibit works of art, which later then quasi turned into an art foundation. Um, the gentlemen I am speaking about aren't with us anymore except Bernard Corte, and the legacy, the cultural dimension and project that was left is um, um, enjoyed today by many visitors. The, the whole Stiftung, the whole foundation was absorbed by the German, German Cultural Agency. And here we're seeing everything as it was in the 80s, between 85 and 88. This is the so-called cafeteria. A very strong social artistic dimension was present there. Uh, all the people employed that were working on this uh, project were art students or artists, so a possibility of um, earning some money for students was, was very important, and at the same time being exposed to a certain type of artistic climate due to the happenings and events that were taking place. So I will quickly go to some of the pavilions designed and eventually built for the museum. This is a very important um, uh, structure. It's called the shed. It served as a concert hall. So often enough, we can create uh, creative environments, situations also with relatively limited amounts of funds. This was the only pre-existing building the house that actually um, Karl Heinz took as his residence to be able to uh, coordinate the development of the project. Now, here we're seeing how the area looks today. So um, there was a massive, massive transformation from potato fields in what we are seeing. So um, uh, why I chose to present Museum Island Hombroisch to you this morning is to Encourage, encourage support for this type of project. Um, my generation of artists in Malta are, must be really happy now that finally we will be getting a structure purely dedicated to the visual arts. Um, it's a first. Um, we've always shared our discipline with other disciplines. We're seeing how, how nature does its, does its job if we give it a chance. And the diversity in terms of fauna and flora that re-inhabited 
um, uh, this, this space, if you had to go on Google Earth and um, fetch up Noise Germany and look up Insel Hombreich, you will see this little island of uh, free form in a extended area of uh, monocultures. So it's, it's, really, it's really an incredible, incredible situation. And today we see how it has grown and become a very important hotspot for culture-oriented visitors that want to have a holistic experience, meaning experiencing um, art. Um, the type of art here is obviously determined by the aesthetics of Erwin Heyrich and Gotthard Graupner and Karl Heinz Müller himself. So it is a particular art direction. So I'm not going to go into the merits of various art forms and art uh, functions, so to say, but um, it is very popular. And a remarkable thing to say is that the buildings were built already in the 80s with recycled, recycled um, bricks that were imported from Holland. So they, they were basically um, cleaned. And to a certain extent, those painting lovers that, that like myself, when you come close to these walls, you see again, a spectacle in, this ter in terms of materiality of the building. Um, here we are seeing um, uh, one of Graupner's works in this very neutral space. Um, uh, Muller had a wide collection of various art forms and um, the concept behind the museum was to create a non-labeled art experience, meaning you should go there prepared on what you are going to see and just, just enjoy it. And I think um, visitors do enjoy it. This is a sculpture by Erwin Heyrich himself. Uh, this is his studio and some of his projects and models that architectural students can still visit today. This is one of the more recent pavilions, the Tade Tadeus Pavilion, and uh, other, other, other pieces of his collection. Some design objects by illustrious Designers, Gary Trittfeld in this case, Matisse Costume, uh, Constantin Brancusi, but that's basically a small sample. I would not want to show you more because I, I encourage you, your next holiday, rather than going uh, to go to this uh, experience. What I was lucky in experiencing was I, I was invited often to certain uh, talks, and um, I was aware of the big difficulties the creators of this project were facing in its initial stages to convince the city of Neuss that this was a good project. Nobody wanted it. <laughs> Nobody wanted it. Similar situation like Paris and the uh, Eiffel Tower or um, uh, Brunelleschi's dome in Milan. In, in the beginning, nobody wants these things. And it was such a success that um, uh, Muller bought some uh, half a kilometer away a second, a second property, which was an ex-NATO rocket station. And, and from there, from there, the rocket station with projects like, like um, this uh, Japanese museum designed by Tadeo Ando is for you to discover. So let's think about it and let's do more in this direction. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm a representative of ERA, the Environment Resources Authority, and I'm here to explain our role in these kind of projects, ideas, initiatives, very much like the one Mikas are having, and we are very happy to see that the intention and the ideas behind it are exactly in line with the policies and the way we would like um, sustainability to happen in our islands. So to understand what ERA does, first we have to understand what ERA does not. We do not plant trees. It is not directly our remit to plant trees. We do not issue development permits and we do not implement environmental projects. 
this is to take away the misconception that era people are out there planting the trees, watering the trees. We are all in favor of that. However, ERA's role is not as an implementary authority, but more as a regulatory. So this is a representative um, of what we actually do. I think the first thing that we have to keep in mind is that ERA issues and develops policies and legislation. This we do after significant consultation with the authorities, with the stakeholders involved, with NGOs, other entities. So our aim is not to issue policies which are drafted from a desk, but actually working with the people who are needing them, who will be using them as guidance. Then we do designations, that is, we um, uh, do reports, scientific analysis and assessment of areas so that we designate areas for which um, there is scientific basis for protection. And these we call the protected areas. There are a variety of these, but um, we will mention those a bit in, uh, in the next slides. We are also a regulator. That is, that when there are these projects and policies, we make sure that they are actually coming out in line with the national environment um, vision that we share. With regards to implementation, we do some kind of implementation, but we need to specify that this is related to enforcement, monitoring, scientific monitoring, and reporting, usually um, directly related to the reporting obligations that we have through European directives. Then we would like to distinguish between the urban and the natural areas, because here we have been um, discussing what type of plants, um, what approach should be taken when choosing species. Of course, there is a difference. In Malta, the difference is not very much spatial because we are touching um, areas together. So we are very knit composite of areas. However, with regards to protection, we need to um, make this difference. When we are speaking about natural areas, the idea is to protect the habitats and species which are native. The projects within these areas are usually focused on restoration. That is trying to restore back, give back to nature um, uh, a, a new beginning so that to restart the process, the ecosystem and the biodiversity will slowly take over. In fact, in these areas, we usually like to, to say that nature thrives in untidy environments. We do not like to have these areas severely managed. These, these are not manicured areas because nature has to be left. And in these areas, we can permit to do so. In urban areas, the scenario changes a bit because the primary um, uh, intention for such areas is for public enjoyment, as we have already mentioned here. So while we would like to copy natural ecosystems within these areas, we have to find a, a more, um, sometimes more difficult balance because we have to allow these areas to be utilized as public areas, safe areas, and clean areas. So we now are introducing, together with various initiatives, green infrastructure, walls, roofs, and the notion of green corridors. That is, these areas which are within the urban fabric can very much help to connect the natural areas, which are um, sometimes far in between. So with regards to designation and policies and guidelines, which are, as we said, our main role, um, we have the Malta's National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan. It is basically, to put it this way, the Bible, the vision, which is on a political um, level, policy-wise, so that everything will start branching out from this main strategy. Similar to this, we are devising a national trees and woodland strategy, 
we have issued this um, intent for public consultation and we, see, we received some feedback on this. And so we are using that feedback to develop it further to make it more um, uh, applicable to the needs of our, of our nation. Then we issue landscaping guidelines. Some landscaping guidelines are specifically for the urban areas. Others are for areas um, which are more ecologically sensitive. In fact, this is where the forestation guidelines come in. We have just completed a set of simple guidelines for everybody which can, can be followed. This is not a scientific docu document. It is not meant to be um, on a scientific level, but rather that for everyone, like the a local council who would have to um, embellish an area, at least he will have the basic principles already there. And the pollinator strategy, which is very important, but which Dr. Baltzan has already um, described. Now, I would like to also make another distinction. We are very much trying to um, communicate this idea of the native species versus the alien. The alien, of course, they are not coming from outer space. It's just they are not supposed to be living within our um, national areas. So what we have is we have a list of alien species, which is even defined through a habitus uh, through a EU directive. And these are actually now legally um, uh, not permitted to be used within in landscape projects. We have some examples here, most of which you can um, uh, identify very easily and which, to be honest, they look good and, and they thrive well. That is why they were introduced in the first place. However, uh, it was maybe a good intention, but the results are far less desirable because to tackle these species, they are not only aliens, but they are also, to make it worse, invasive. Invasive because they take over, they are more aggressive and they compete better than the species we generally find in our countryside. And um, uh, with, with regards to this, we, we help and we collaborate on exceed to propagation of the native species. So native species which are now being threatened and the populations are low and the locations are very sparse, we try to um, have collaboration with the botanical gardens, with the university, with the NGOs. So we propagate more of these native species so we have a better supply for these projects. With regards to invasive alien species, of course, the, uh, the, um, uh, the approach is completely different. We collaborate, for example, with Ambient Malta, with um, uh, parks and uh, green. So we tackle these species by trying to control, where possible, their spread. We have also um, a guidelines with regards to the control and uh, good practice with regards to these species. As we said, and that's why we are here, we love to collaborate with other entities. We are always um, uh, having these two-way conversations. Of course, the first draft usually of a project needs uh, a lot of discussions. And that is why some projects take long. And that is why sometimes we get accused that air is taking too long. Unfortunately, it is not a straightforward um, process. Even discussions between the experts, we, we not always agree between ourselves because this is not uh, clean science, to put it that way. So there are different approaches how to go about it. But um, uh, Finally, we get there and the results are usually um, much better than just doing a project without any consultations. We have agreements with um, NGOs. These are environment organizations such as Nature Trust, BirdLife. Um, and the agreements we have are intended to manage particular areas. Most importantly, the protected areas which fall within Natura 2000 network. Which, uh, which are the priority areas for which we dedicate a lot of resources and attention. We also um, sometimes manage to um, open calls, such as the Bellus call, which uh, was the recently 
sorry, which was recently launched. And this, through these projects, we invite local councils, even NGOs and other authorities to propose projects funded through ERA. So like this, we are actually giving a chance for uh, more of these projects. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Good afternoon. And uh, I'm aware that I'm the last speaker, so I'll keep an eye on the time not to test your patience. Um, but for my little contribution, I'd like to focus on one of the themes that was in the title of this, uh, of this conference, which is connecting to nature. And to me, this is a fundamental element of this discussion we are having today, which is not only the provision of green spaces, but one of the reasons why we need to provide green spaces. So in terms of connectedness to nature, I would first of all like to start with what the, referencing what the gentleman um, said earlier about this artificiality of talking about humans and nature. And I fully agree with you, and I would point out that this is not a universal um, uh, distinction. It's something typical of Western culture, maybe, but not something that is a given. It's a, it's a distinction we have created. But it is also a distinction that has become more and more marked. And uh, Professor Lin this morning referenced nature deficit disorder. And I'd like to just start by showing you some, uh, some, some data from a study, which I, I find quite interesting, which looked at nature references and culture products. So this is not looking at the level of the individual, but looking at collectives. So works of fiction, film, um, songs. And looking at nature references, in, in uh, bodies of work over a substantial time period. And what this study consistently found is that from the 1950s, around the 1950s onwards, we see this consistent decline in actually how much we talk about nature and our cultural products. This is for works of fiction, English fiction. Um, this is for popular song lyrics. And again, you see the same kind of downward trend for the most part. And the last graph with a similar trend is for film. And in fact, the, um, uh, part of what is discussed in this study is also the fact that there have been replacements even in dictionaries, taking out words that relate to nature and putting in words like blogging and vlogging and technology-related words. And, and this is something that may seem trivial on the face of it, but actually isn't, because it is a, a reflection of something much bigger that is happening in our societies. And this is this phenomenon of nature disconnect, which you may say is a product of our times, it's the nature of how the world goes, yes, um, uh, technology plays a bigger role in our lives, but this is something that does matter. And again, I'll focus on the local context, I think it is pretty obvious that opportunities to actually connect with nature locally are scarce and becoming scarcer. And it is a sad reality that if we look at many of our urban um, landscapes, we see very little nature in there. And I am concerned not only about this from the point of view of biodiversity conservation um, and many of the themes we've been discussing this morning, but I am especially concerned about this in terms of what it means for us. And I come from a, from a biodiversity conservation background. One of the big challenges we face in conservation is getting people to change their behavior. And teaching only gets you to a very limited point. You can tell people nature is important, the environment is important, climate change is happening. But telling people is a very, very small part of solving the problem. What you need is a much more fundamental mindset change. And again, uh, for example, you mentioned this this morning, um, the, the issue of mindset, the, the change in values. And what we see with this nature disconnect, um, and again, similar terms, similar theories that talk about things like extinction of experience, is that the lack of interaction with nature actually changes us. And it does matter at two levels. It matters at the level of the self, and we've heard terms like well-being this morning, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, but it also matters at the level of society. And let me start with this self level, and I'm going to show you again some data. This is from a study conducted in the UK, um, uh, the monitor of engagement with the natural environment study, which has been conducted annually for several years, um, with a, a representative sample of close to 5,000 um, uh, 5, residents. And it looks at characteristics of how people interact with nature. 
And there are some very, in, some, some very interesting, actually, conclusions from this. So if you look at things like health, we have a lot of evidence that generally nature is good for our health. Nature helps us be more active. It helps us um, relax. It's extremely beneficial for our mental well-being. But what we see here, for example, is that nature visits and nature connectedness play a role. But I want to point to that little, well, the big, actually, the big red circle at the bottom, which is local green space. And what was, what was interesting in this study is that living, what they found is that living in a green area was actually negatively correlated with general health, which may seem a little bizarre in terms of what we're talking about today. The, the, the reason behind this is that it's not just having the space, but how we use the space. And that is something we haven't really talked about uh, much today. Um, we need to also consider the interaction that we have with space and the relationship that people have with that natural space. And if we look at the second kind of column of figures there, this tells us a lot more about that. This is referring to eudaimonic well-being, which is basically the perception that your life is worthwhile, your life has meaning. And you will see that the big circle there talks about nature connectedness. More than actual contact or visits with nature, the one factor that was found to be extremely important is the sense that you are part of nature, that you have a connection with the natural world. And this is not something that is fostered just by plonking a green space in the neighborhood and expecting people to use it. We need to think about how we get people to interact with these spaces and how we develop a relationship that is not just intellectual, but emotional, that is effective, that people grow up to learn and, and love nature. And in fact, what is, again, very interesting to me from this study is that this point about eudaimonic well-being, the sense of life having meaning, nature connectedness was found to be much, much more important than things like socioeconomic status, which you might think is a much more obvious influence, or nature visits um, themselves or local green space. So it's the sense of people feeling like they are part of something bigger, people having this biophilic um, connection with nature. And um, I also mentioned the kind of social level of this discussion. Maybe this is where I come into this topic. As I said, my background is in biodiversity conservation. And what has become, I think, more and more obvious to people working in conservation is that we need this fundamental mindset change. And we're not going to get it just by telling people that nature is important. There needs to be something deeper than that. And what is interesting is that nature connectedness, and again, I'm talking about this, um, I mean, it, it is a, a bit of a vague concept, it's a psychological construct at the end of the day, but what we're talking about is just this relationship that people have with the natural world. Uh, nature connectedness has been found to be linked to both pro-nature behaviors and to pro-environmental behaviors. Basically, people are more prone to act in ways that are ecologically conscious or to adopt environmentally friendly behaviors when they feel like they have this connection with nature. And to get that connection with nature, you need to actually have the opportunity to develop it, which is why I go back to those slides I showed you of the urban fabric of Malta and where my concern arises. Because if we have children, and I mentioned children especially because they, these are the ages, the childhood years that are especially critical for developing these connections, if we have children who live in sterile apartments and go to school in school grounds where you have absolutely no natural space and the interaction with nature is constrained to maybe a few minutes on a, on a weekend, how can you develop any type of nature connectedness? And as I said, from the point of view of conservation, I find this to be a, a, a kind of an illustrative quote because it's, um, and again, the same, same author that, uh, that you referenced this morning, that as the care of nature increasingly becomes an intellectual concept, severed from the actual experience of the outdoors, you have to wonder where will future environmentalists come from? And at the local level, we don't actually have much data about how people interact with nature. But at the Institute of Earth Systems, we are actually doing some work on this subject, and this is um, preliminary and ongoing, so I will just show you a couple of snippets. But one of the things that really, really stands out from the work we're doing is that there is an immense thirst for nature in Malta. People universally um, and across all demographics say that basically they want to spend more time in green and natural spaces. And um, parents in particular point out uh, that they really would like their children to have a lot more opportunities to spend time in green and natural spaces. Um, 
And one other thing that emerges clearly, again, I'm not sure you can read this well, is that there is a general dissatisfaction with the spaces that we currently have. So th this is showing the top um, set of graphs is showing um, what people think an ideal green space should, should be. It should be a good place for children to play. It should be a good place for health and well-being, places that are in as natural a state as possible, places that provide opportunities to see nature with an easy walking distance. And you see that, I mean, generally, the, the blue figures are what people want more strongly. The bottom set of charts is showing what they actually think of the places we have locally, the, the green spaces we have locally. Mm -hmm. And you will see, for example, in terms of um, being good places for mental health and well-being, or being places that provide opportunities to see nature, very often the, the ranking between the ideal and the actual, um, there's a very obvious disparity there. Mm -hmm. um, which brings me to the question now of how do we actually foster connectedness? And this is maybe what I'd like to throw into the mix of the discussion um, this morning, um, which is basically that there are known pathways to nature connection. And as I said, this is not just providing a green space, but thinking about how people are going to use that. I mentioned, thing, I mentioned children, for example. One of the obvious avenues for fostering connectedness is to look at schools. And one of the doctoral projects currently underway at the Institute is in fact looking at creating nature spaces in schools so that children have regular, sustained opportunities to interact with nature, um, not in a cosmetic way, but in a fundamental way. But even in terms of urban gardens, because that's ultimately the theme we're here to discuss, we need to think of ways in which we can address these different pathways to actually developing nature connections. So things like actually having the opportunity to explore nature through all the senses, having the opportunity to actually understand, learn, interact with nature, to develop a sense of compassion. Not just that nature is there for our benefit, for our production, but to understand ecological cycles, to understand, to develop a sense of um, compassion with, with kind of other forms of life. And on that note, I know I've gone out of time. <laughs> so, <laughs> well done. Yes, I am looking at the clock, so thank you very much. Um, thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you, everybody, for your very fascinating presentations. I'd like to, for the sake of continuity, take off from where Elizabeth left off. Um, your, your uh, statement, which Professor Lim had mentioned, that we need a change of mindset. And uh, your first three slides were quite an eye-opener, actually quite shocking, to think that we are speaking less and mentioning nature less. And, uh, coming, and coming back to what Professor Lim was talking about, how we need people to feel this awareness, it suddenly crossed my mind that there are many um, adages and many proverbs that my mother used to use that were all related to sustainability and to green, you know? Waste not, want not, um, I don't know, variety is a spice of life, um, a stitch in time saves nine, all these uh, proverbs that everybody used to use. So it was their guide. And I have my serious doubts how much these ESGs that we talk about are actually filtering down to that grassroot level. So an ancient wisdom which was developed over millennia, I would say, is getting lost. And I cannot think of any other way to reinvent a common attitude and a common mindset than through education. Is there anything you can suggest that would begin to create a new set of guidelines, which I would say need to use contemporary technologies like social media, no? because that is the biggest tool that we have today. We're discussing with CJ this, this during the break about how, in a way, we need imagination, and we have this incredible tool that, unfortunately, at least I can say this from an architectural industry point of view, is dulling our imagination because we have um, so much richness on our social media that it becomes too easy to say, I'm going to design something for you which looks like this, and then I go on to, I go on to Pinterest. Somebody mentioned an app. I was just wondering whether any of you have an idea of 
how these new technologies are actually investing us with new ways together to, co to uh, confront these sustainability and green issues without necessarily depending on experts talking about them at conferences. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Can I say That's, something yes, yes. provocative here? Yeah. I actually think that all these apps and technology, in a way, somebody's going to throw something at me in a minute, is actually <laughs> limiting mm. our imagination. It's actually stopping us from imagining beyond what we know already. And I think imagination is absolutely key to our future. It doesn't matter if it's in the science world or the sort of creative world. I think we need imagination. We need the nuance of humanity in the, our imagination to progress forward. So my take is technology is limiting us. If you can see, not just that. I mean, in the UK recently, we have been having articles, the headlines that AI is taking over everything that we are doing. You can actually have AI to write a song for you. You can have AI that actually would design for you. You could have AI that replaces Tom Cruise from being Tom Cruise. <laughs> that we have seen images of these things. And the thing is that, you know, I, I think that to me is almost sort of frightening in a way. And so that's my position. I would like to hear the, the position of others. So I think, you know, I just want to say, I, I love your presentation, Elizabeth. I, and the thing is that the, your five pathways should be under the sort of the keys to imagination. Yes. for children and adults at the same time, not just children. But I think, you know, so my position, technology is the evil bit. So just to provoke all of you well, to, to get engaged. <laughs> I didn't say it's evil. I think it has, it has its purposes, but like any tool, we just have to, to, uh, uh, to balance out how we, how we engage with it. I mean, it's useful, it's functional, and it, it does give us shortcuts. But I think we have to balance out, particularly in, in how it can easily uh, stop us from uh, re-engaging with the real world. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm, I'm that scared of AI. <laughs> I think it has its purposes, but certainly uh, when it comes to how much time uh, it takes us away from the natural world, certainly it has its, uh, you know, th there are the, the dangers. Um, so so I'll, I'll stop at that. <laughs> You're more moderate than me. <laughs> <laughs> if Anton, can, I know Anton teaches at the, at, the, at the Department of Built Environment. And I'm wondering whether the students whom you meet who are in the, during the first years, so in a way they still haven't been, let's say, indoctrinated by the department, <laughs> whether they come to, the, to study architecture with a lot of imagination and how much does uh, so do social media uh, limit them? Well, mostly our students come from a lot of stress. A lot of stress? Stress, first and foremost, to be accepted into the course. So um, there isn't really much time to do anything else but get the necessary qualifications. So that is basically what they mainly complain about. And uh, this foundation course in design studies that was introduced, I think, around 2011, was a kind of break from that kind of rat race situation to get in and then basically calm down and slowly open eyes. And one of the important exercises our students were asked to do in semester one uh, was to go out, we go out together, there's a little pinatum on campus, and I ask the students to draw trees. <laughs> so, um, surprisingly enough, a lot of the students look at me and say, uh, we're not going to draw perspective, we're not going to do draw buildings, we're going to draw trees. So, I'm happy to say now, I think uh, it's been over 20 years that I'm making Maltese students for the first time something that lacks in the educational system, in their primary, secondary, and sixth form stage, to simply go out in a garden and discover a tree. And there's a whole methodology there. Why? Because 
often enough, the biggest mistakes are done at root level. The roots are cut a straight line. And one of the really interesting discussions I have with students is explaining that there's another tree underground, the roots. So the energy coming from beneath has to be transmitted in this drawing of the part we are, the part we are actually seeing. So the invisible part is so important to create um, what we're experiencing on top. And, and I think, I think um, these beasts <laughs> huh, are taking a lot of um, that free time that students used to have before. I'm seeing a drastic change in the abilities of students. When I started in Malta in 2001, um, working with the faculty and students now. So there was before a more applied approach. Students were used to working more with their hands, where now when one asks them to get their hands dirty, <laughs> and one has a fright. And I think the idea of nature, gardening, playing with soil, um, going down with a microscope and seeing all that um, incredible microcosmos that that is happening. I think we don't need incredible botanical specimens to be impressed by the beauty of nature and by design, the design that is hidden there. So, yeah. Well, that kind of tells, talks to me about something else, which also came up in all your, in all your uh, presentations, um, which in a way, uh, reminds me of an introduction I make of myself whenever I'm faced with students who are, well, half, less than half my age. I tell them that I was 30 years old when the Berlin Wall came down. So I lived half my life in the so-called modern world and half my life in the postmodern world. And I was brought up reading spy novels and my world was divided into two, East and West, capitalist and communist, gay and straight, male and female. And you never crossed those borders because if you went from East to West, you probably got shot. If you went <laughs> from straight to gay, you got thrown into prison. And that they have actually, I have an advantage that I can see where things are coming from. They have an advantage that they are not limited by these divisions. And as we were talking, I was thinking perhaps part of the problem in this is that we are still basing our thoughts on the subject, on the legacy of the modern period, which is landscape and building are two separate things with a big divide between the two. And that, as CJ was saying, cities, which are wise cities, are cities which not in, that don't only incorporate green, but have green as part of their soul, like building as part of their soul. And as an architect working in Malta um, and presenting projects to the planning authority, you realize that our world in our head is only about building, not about green. And that perhaps planning needs to integrate this aspect in a way which is not a separate thing or a complementary thing or something which makes it more beautiful or something which is necessary to get your permit. But it has to be in the mindset, as we said. Um, where am I going from here? <laughs> <laughs> the dichotomy, sir. So right the but for example, uh, the project that, that you, Andrew, and, and Georgina presented is about that, because even the bastions themselves had a function, which was military, but it also was reshaping the landscape. So it was about building, it was about function, it was about protection, but it was also about creating beauty. So perhaps... Yes. I, I was going to say that with, in terms of the technology and, and this imagination that you have when creating a garden, um, a lot of my ideas and all, all your, or the inspiration comes obviously from the natural world and walking around and in talking, engaging with people as much as possible. But that being said, after all the designs you've done, after all the planting plans you've got, all the plant numbers you've got, in your, all your ducks in a row for when you come and actually do the design. It's not until you start laying the plants out and you start planting them down and you start, it's that moment in time is when the real imagination comes into its forefront and you can explore the vision that's in your head and engage with other people and go, oh yes, that, that to me is where the real passion and the art comes from. And I really look forward to doing it with my cast. Sure. <laughs> yeah. 
But also part of this commonality that we require is what, or the lack of it, is what makes Stephen start his presentation saying, ah, we don't plant trees. <laughs> Why? Because everybody thinks ah, trees, era plants trees. But the truth is, everybody should plant trees. Architects should plan for their trees. Clients should ask their architects to plant trees. Trees have to be part of our life, like eating and sleeping, planting trees. So it doesn't have to be relegated to a particular institution, which is governed by a government. It has to be part of a mindset. I don't know if Stephen wants to comment on this. Uh, in fact, as I told you, ERA works a lot with other institutions, other authorities, even big national projects. And we always try to drive this concept which you have mentioned here. That's planning. It's not as an afterthought, um, let's find a place to put some greenery. The, from the planning stages, even with the guidelines that we issue, every project should start being drafted with this in mind. Because then at a later stage, it will become, look, no, you are causing a problem, you are now uh, going into a thing which we already catered for, now you are disrupting our plans. So that's why from the initial stages, any project which has the potential of supporting some greenery, some wildlife, should take this into consideration at the draft um, uh, stage. Yeah, but I think what Andrew was saying as well, and the project for Micas is quite a role model, I can say, for the way uh, these projects should be tackled, because it's not an afterthought, as far as I... No, no, know. It's, it, it's, was it was a, uh, you know, from... The, it was in the vision from the start, but also when you think of it, it's uh, the, the project itself is in Floriana. Floriana is uh, transected by a, you know, a taraway that, you know, it has all that traffic going into Valletta. So I think the need for it, apart from the fact that it's near to other ecosystems, I think it, it, it was necessary to, to bring it on board from the very start. Can, can I make a point on this planning um, yeah, sure. comment? Um, uh, I, I fully agree with what you're saying, that this is personal, it, it's personal choices and all of that, but I think we also need to discuss the goal of institutions. And I think if we look at the local scene, I, I think we have to acknowledge that the planning system has not helped in this regard. Um, I think our planning system has frankly failed us when it comes to thinking strategically about the role of nature in our lives. Um, and I think it, as part of this conversation, we do need to talk about the reform of our planning system to actually have a strategic vision of place, of community, of, of nature in our buildings. And it can't happen as long as, as our planning system remains primarily development driven and addressing things on a very piecemeal basis. Uh, I mean, talking of urban gardens is, it's fantastic, it's a step in the right direction, but those spaces for urban gardens are going to be limited. We need to, I think, go beyond that to talk about the urban fabric in general and how we plan that. Yes, unfortunately, uh, at least from my experience, uh, urban gardens insert themselves in leftover spaces. Exactly. But in a way, isn't that what you were suggesting when you talked about rewilding and restitching areas of the city through abandoned spaces. Absolutely. I, um, I think it provides an opportunity in the sense a lot of our public spaces are unfortunately quite dire, but they quite an opportunity because sometimes I look at spaces and say, actually, it, you could consider this to be ugly, but the minute you look at it from a nature point of view, it's, uh, then it can become much more interesting Absolutely. Because the things that, for example, in London, for example, during the pandemic, when we're not allowed to venture out, in those months, those abandoned spaces became incredibly beautiful meadows that we never set eyes on because we are so sh superficial in our aesthetic values that we thought, oh, it's abandoned space. But nature came back during those months that humans were not disturbing it or anything. That's yeah. wonderful. I think going back to your, your, your thing about the division between architecture, landscape, and all that, I think I'm going to say something, another thing, not something, another thing which is controversial, 
apart from offending everybody who's into AI and technology early on, <laughs> um, is that we should abandon the word architecture, planning, and landscape. It should be considered just as place and space making. So the thing is that, you know, it doesn't matter if you make something out of concrete or stone or daffodils or lilac or uh, plants. It's about making a space and place. And I think that would actually then stop this division and look into a more coherent understanding of place making and space making and also engagement also with the different sort of generations as well. And rather than saying, you know, I'm actually making a building to do this. I'm, you know, and, and the things that the value of that would really, really be, it would actually simplify and also make it more accessible to everybody concerned, those who use the space, the, those who uh, empower the space, those who fund the space. Uh, and I think that that would be an important start. I have always said to the university, kill the word architecture, kill the word urban design, <laughs> kill the word urban planning, kill the word landscape, don't divide. We tend to divide, we like to, yes, but that's, yeah, the legacy we like to of, box things. Yes, it's a legacy of modernism and the enlightenment, putting things in boxes yes. to be able to handle the world and reality better. But in fact, reality is much more complex than that. Yes. And uh, but then it becomes quite difficult to handle. <laughs> That's why we are, we are boxing sort of everything from, you know, what you said about the Berlin Wall, the East and the West, you know, walls and things like that. They box each other mm. from gender to identity to sort of culture, understanding to ethnicity to groups and communities. We box them together. We have boundaries, you know, yeah. and I think these boundaries are very dangerous. Yes. There also used to be a lack of boundaries between language and, uh, um, and nature, for example. Words which were used a lot in rural uh, settlements are all getting lost, most of them connected to nature. One of which I can relate to you, which, was, which is a word which exists in Maltese, to say that it's, getting, it's becoming chilly and the temperatures are dropping, which is a word, ilanjas, mm -hmm. which is a derivative of the word pear, because apparently pears ripen, apparently I say that because I am too, I'm detached from nature, <laughs> pears <laughs> ripen in cooler weather. Mm. So I was with a friend and we were crossing, it was pouring with rain and we were getting out of a car. And this gentleman who was on a, what used to be the Heritage Advisory Committee, which I was on, was teaching me this. And he said, no, listen, we were in a village in Safi, I remember, and he said, now listen to this. There was a lady crossing the road. And he said, ah, Atilanja, senior Atilanja. She said, yeah, yeah, Atilanja. <laughs> so already it's affecting this detachment from nature is affecting our language. And not only is it affecting our language, that, that is why that slide which says that the amount of times that nature is used in our literature, which in turn is taught in our schools, which in turn is supposed to be influencing the future generations, is getting lost. So ideally, as you said, there should be hope that we reverse that situation. Um. Well, certainly the loss in, in vocabulary and, and you know, uh, these semantic fields for, for uh, uh, anything to connect it with nature is a, is a reflection of, you know, our distance from nature and how, you know, and what to do? I mean, languages always evolve, so there's always words that will fall by the yes. wayside and new ones that will come in. Nonetheless, but that, I think it's a good reflection of, yes, well, of the state uh, uh, we're in, I think. Well, one shouldn't uh, disqualify the other. No, no, no of course not. <laughs> and I was wondering whether this theme of nature could be introduced in schools when teaching for example, English language, or when or Maltese, or uh, any other uh, literature. So the choice of a curriculum, which is also based on how much nature features and how much it is a protagonist. Yeah, but it has to be within a, an experience-based context. When you're teaching, um, uh, you know, in language in in, uh, in isolation, that that usually is not uh, not going Are you to sure? work. Well, it's not going to work because you need the experience. You need the experience. It might work in terms of rote memory, etc. But in terms of grounding it in experience, that's your best takeaway and your best uh, possible, uh, that's you know, true. route what's, to success. What's about that? But I think you know what they teach teach in school is not a reduction of 
the world experience and knowledge. They should teach imagination. Mm -hmm. I mean, school curriculum nowadays has been so reduced that they teach the very basic and, you know, the generations are not really kind of worldly, should we say. There's no more imagination in the school curriculum at any level. So I think, you know, one of the key things is to really not teach just nature as a standalone thing, but under the umbrella of imagination, there should be many categories of things to teach. And I think that will be one way of really extending the education and the hope for a better future. Because the things that we're so limited to a reductive understanding of the world, and a reductive understanding of the world is not enough. And I think, you know, so in my days, I feel that, you know, when, when we didn't have certain technologies or access of books and things like that, it was the imagination that kept us all excited, interested. I want to be curious. I want to be curious about things that I don't know. Nowadays, everybody, because of you can get it on the phone, it becomes, you could become very blasé about it. You just say, if I don't read it today, I'll read it tomorrow. It's always there, you know. So I think, you know, there's a great value and agency that imagination should be taught. It doesn't matter if science, economics, or creativity, I think. Imagination, imagination will inform any uh, section, let's say, of reality or, or knowledge, whether it's politics, economics. Um, yeah, it should be... But imagination, there's a caveat to it. Imagination also comes with risks. And yes. we should all take risks. Anton, don't you agree? <laughs> fully, fully. <laughs> and on this point of the curriculum, actually, I think we also need imagination on how we teach the curriculum. Mm -hmm. I, I mentioned the, a, a doctoral project that we have underway at the moment, and part of that is actually looking at teaching outdoors. You don't have to teach English in the classroom. Exactly. Teach English in nature, in the nature Exactly. Space. Teach maths in the nature space. And, and that provides us opportunity to, to observe, to learn, to see things in a different context. And, and it's interesting, I mean, I, I teach at university, and even at university level, we see this thirst, even from students, from our own students, who tell us, listen, take us outdoors. If we can do a lecture outdoors, let's just go outdoors. And, and I think there is an element of technology fatigue as well among students. I think they, them, although I, I get the point you mentioned, that technology provides huge opportunities, but I think there is an element of fatigue and there is a realization, even amongst younger generations, that when they take a step back from that, it's good for them. It's actually good for them to be off their phones for an hour and to just look at something different. We don't have an educator on this panel, but I'd be quite curious to know, because clearly when I was growing up, you respected your teacher because the teacher transferred knowledge to you. He knew much more than you. But well, today, well, I'll stop you there, but you, uh, you, know, you will assume today that you and the teacher have something to, to share. Yes, yes, and, yes. And, you know, where you, you're, yes, 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 you're it's, meeting at some point. Uh, and, absolutely, and but, it's not only about the, but it's not only about the transfer no, of no. information, which exactly. is easily available. Perhaps I was wrong there. I should have said transfer of knowledge yeah, because, well, or wisdom, which comes back to the first uh, discussion we had about about ancient wisdom, which is sadly getting, getting lost. So it would, be, it would be quite fascinating to see how imagination is taught in schools, or how it can be taught, or how successful it is when we try to do it. But I think imagination should not just be limited to an educated audience. Mm. It should be for everybody in every community, it doesn't matter if it's the, the government or somebody who actually sweeps the street, they should have the kind of imagination that allows a kind of diverse position of understanding of our built environment, our world, our politics. And in a way, that's what democracy is about. And I think that's really, really important. I think, you know, the lady there, I remember you asked me a question, what would what lesson can I convey or wisdom can I convey to you? You should really think that, you know, it's the kind of imagination that, you should, that will propel your conversation, that would actually propel your, your, with your, you know, to empower you to engage with your clients, for example, with the, the people you design for. 
So I think that's that's really really important. So it cannot be just for the elite. It's no, I, I agree with you. But then you mentioned the farmers who were being displaced when cities were being planned in China, and they said, "I don't mind because I want to live in a skyscraper." So our economic formula is so strong that a farmer does not have enough imagination to think, actually, if I stay here and cultivate the land to feed the people who are here, this is going to make me more money than if I go and reside in a, in a, in a... But the thing is that when I speak to these farmers in China, when they tell me their aspirations is to live in skyscrapers, in air conditioning units and, and so forth, and abandon their farmhouse and their farm altogether, I actually spelled it out very clearly, the disillusionment of what happens afterwards. You know, the thing is that they are not educated. They would not be able to get an office job. They actually don't have other skills apart from farming. So what they end up doing is standing by the roadside, squatting by the roadside, waiting for construction companies to come with a truck to say, okay, today you can come on this site and work for us to, for today, tomorrow, and the week. But when the job is finished, you go back to lining the streets, you know, waiting for the job to come. So it was also really important that for me, as somebody who was engaging with the community, to really look into how to develop the community from a farming community to something else, you know, that the consequence of a bad turn, how that would affect it. Because once they lost the land, they're no longer able to be in control of the situation. Because if they are patient enough, China will realize that they will need these farmers more than ever before. They are their eco-warriors to sustain them to actually, because who is going to feed all these billion of people they have? We're not talking about the size of Malta here. We're talking about a huge, huge country, a huge population. So the things that, you know, I think it's really important also to spell out not just the, the wonderful dreams that comes with it and the imagination that comes with, uh, through dreams, but the things that also this, the disillusionment that could come. And I think that's also important. I, I, you know, my role is not as an architect has always been, you know, that it should be about optimism. But sometimes I think we all need to know the consequence of certain decisions that we make, either individual or collective. I agree. I think it's time for uh, questions from the floor. So if anybody would like to comment. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I talk too much. No, no, it's okay. That's just okay. Sure, sure. Uh, no, Nick. Like? Hi. Um, yes, please. Just a quick comment. Um, Professor Lim, I really agree with all your arguments. I really think that these ideas need to be taken on board. And also yours, Conrad, about going back to ancient wisdom or searching to other sources of knowledge that we might have lost and we might find in other places. Um, we always turn to education. I'm an educator myself. So for me, education is extremely special and the most important place to work with. <laughs> But we also have to keep in mind that education is institutionalized and it's hierarchical. Our own University of Malta was built in a site where farmers had to be displaced for it to be built. And this is something that we don't acknowledge within the whole structure and the, the, the development of these institutions. So the methodologies and how we engineer education, how we plan education, going back to imagination, going back to sources of knowledge that today don't, do not figure within the institution, I think those need to be given a lot of priority. You know, understanding how people work and how they work, how they labor collectively, not for the individual, not for the self, um, but for collective knowledge and for collective responsibility and obligation. That's it, thanks. Yes, that's a very valid point. Thank you, okay. <clears throat> thanks, Conrad. Um, I just wanted to pick up on a thread that I thought was really incredible, as all of you are incredible educators and um, thought provokers. Elizabeth made a point about children and um, not having green spaces in elementary schools. Um, CJ talked about technology. Andrew talked about walking for inspiration in nature. I mean, the big disconnect, which I think should be amplified, is the emotional connection. And I think what education is doing that we have all experienced differently, growing up in green spaces, CJ growing up in a village, I went to a boarding school that was probably 80% green and 20% uh, concrete. 
<laughs> so we've had these great opportunities because we've had opportunities to emotionally attach ourselves to things that um, it's what we're killing right now is emotion. And it's not that technology is bad. Technology is killing how we feel and how we relate. And, you know, I come from an art background, so we always say art history is not linear because everything is interrelated. We have interdisciplinary, you know, ideas, and I think it's a big thing, at least in the U.S., where a lot of kids are taking interdisciplinary classes. So I would just love to hear um, from, and Anton talked about kids going and making them paint trees, and they're like, well, we came here, and this is a specific thing we came to learn so we can then go get a job and be successful. Breaking that pattern is what education and educators should do. So I'd love to hear more about how you feel about the, the destruction of emotion, how we're sterilizing ourselves and we're trying to disconnect and to, for, you know, to be successful. So, I mean, it's more common, but really I, I'm very curious to find out from all of you what, what emotion and what emotionally attaches you to nature and how you think we can bring emotion back into, you know, the practice of everyday life. I'm sure that's one of the main themes of Micus. Well, I think in, in Micus's case, it's, it's trying to art itself, you know, and that, that uh, opportunity to, to uh, be in an environment where you can um, access art, um, access nature, access, have access to spaces, hopefully that can, can engender, um, you know, that reconnect. Of course, we, can't, we don't have a magic wand, um, but we would like to, to be more actively involved in communities too, and, you know, and how to, to, uh, to ensure that, you know, through this, uh, through this engagement, we, and through the opportunities we provide. Of course, there's a lot of work to do. I think we're all aware of the, the issues. I think on a European level, certainly, the, the, this, this is quite, um, uh, you know, quite something we have to contend with uh, in the Western world, certainly. Um, uh, whether we, you know, we, uh, we encourage our, our youngsters to um, enough uh, to, uh, you know, to to change those perceptions because ultimately it's a, it's about changes in perceptions no perception will change uh, and then you know unless we we encourage uh, those changes and more importantly no changes in habit will occur unless we we really work hard to change perceptions so it has to be a mainstreamed effect i think it has to be a mainstreamed effort um, not in isolation. I mean, as, as we, we discussed earlier, I don't know if I'm answering your, your question. <laughs> I was saying that uh, Micus is fantastic. The reason I'm here is for Micus and the way, um, you know, Micus is bringing, uh, it, it is an interdisciplinary place where ideas are coming in. This educational conference or this today is very much about, like, it's about art, but it's about how art is so dependent on everything else. Um, but my, my question really was to the, you know, um, to the teaching aspect of how we introduce emotion back into something practical, which is no different than um, CJ talking about okay. how he doesn't want it to be called architecture planning. He wants it <laughs> to be called something. And I think we have to go there. We absolutely have to go so we can th think in a very different way, you know. From how I see it, I think art is about opening eyes. Opening eyes means enhancing sensitivity. Once one is sensitive, one will react to the environment around him or around her. So um, maybe we have underestimated the real potential of even art education in this context. Sometimes we tend to give art and art teaching or art communicating rather than teaching um, a scientific function. So we've, we've, we've over-scientificified everything. We need to have an explanation for everything. But just going to a very simple exercise, um, I, I believe in drawing. I believe in taking a piece of paper, a piece of charcoal, a piece of pencil, 
and creating something either through observation or through pure imagination. Any child that has made that experience and understood what for a creative potential that exists in each and every one of us, making an experience in what MICAS projects to be, because maybe today we spoke more about the environmental um, nature, um, the plants, which is absolutely fantastic. But the idea when I spoke of art parallel to nature in the project by um, uh, in the Museum Island, Hombroj, and, and how one experiences this incredible silence and beauty of nature and then goes into a neutral structure and experiences the beauty of what mankind can produce. Because again, art is a product of our humanity. So, so humanity and art parallel to each other, I think in conjunction with a more, an easier form of education. I think education has become so heavy, so intense. I, I meet so many students that really don't have the guts of enjoying what they're learning. So, and, and trying to throw that overboard and, and try to re restart the whole system. And as Joseph Albers said, to open eyes, to use these incredible tools to discover color. And then all of a sudden you go out there and these plants are doing all that game, exactly. playing with color there in front of you. Fireworks of nature happening in 1.5 centimeters. So sometimes you say, wow, do I need all this? Do I, do I need, do I need, do I need this company? Do I need, uh, it's, it's all there. So um, I am lucky to have discovered at a relatively late stage in my life, going fishing with a friend. Late, very late. And Hi. I said, what were you doing all the time before? And this, this gentleman took me down to a very special location called Il Blat at Al Melch. It's um, below, below, um, uh, help me. <laughs> and it's very difficult to get there, but going down there, you actually encounter Malta's real natural environment. So if it's the birds, it's the plants, and you have to be very careful not to step on something because if not, you won't see it again when you come <laughs> next time. So be wise and see where you place your foot. But being there early hours of the morning, hearing the sea, hearing the birds, listening to the music of the waves, and all of a sudden, an incredible fish turns up in front of you. Your breast is about to explode <laughs> because it's so big, it's so beautiful. Please don't bite. Because <laughs> I don't know what to do if you do bite. So uh, that is enough. That is enough to charge me to go and work in the studio. I've, I've, oh I've gathered so much stimulus. I've gathered so much sensation. I've, I've had my batteries so powerfully charged that the outcome is then unpredictable. And having a combination of a natural environment or an artificial environment. These are artificial spaces. So I don't think we should really speak of nature, but man-made versions of what nature used to be. So, so again, again, what Bernard Corte did in the Museum Island, Ombro, she tried to give that space its original format post Ice Age. So again, again, it is an eye opener, opening eyes to understand what we have and if we don't behave, what we are going to lose. So again, a powerful element that, in my opinion, MICAS should be a, um, a starting point in a sequence of projects that follow this pattern. Because having a knowledgeable approach of creating a garden with all the information we have now, I think that should should be um, moved into other areas or other projects if by starting from Valletta and Floriana. Floriana has one side, which is um, uh, this side of the bastion, but there's the cruise passenger terminal on the other side. Just above it is, an and is another garden pocket that could have a lot of rehabilitation uh, happening in it. So 
But I am absolutely convinced that the people love green space. I've experienced it some weeks ago. We had um, the May Day flower, flower set up in front of the palace. I sat there on the bench with my wife and heard what some uh, old couples were saying and saying, wow, can't we have this all the time? Can't you have this more often? Can't we? And to think what an incredible logistic effort it was to recreate that space there and give this nature feeling, I think, I think we, can, we can do a lot. And um, what... Yes. Maybe should our our objective should be is convince more people, help help yes, our yeah. politicians, pull this rope. So I think I think I think um, th yes, these hope. are all beautiful. There's pro hope. Yes, there's, there's hope. hope. There's hope. <laughs> Ma I think Mario, uh, Mario would like I to understand what he said. Yeah, I I think that what we have been mentioning is is really amazing because if you think about it, we're talking about so much plurality of values. An artist values the view, or it's an inspiration, you know, of, of nature. Okay, doing fishing in a remote place, you 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 you're learning so much. You are enjoying nature. Um, someone might want for want to go for a run, for example, or to discover nature. You know, the plurality of values. We all value nature in so many different ways. And and I think what what you were presenting uh, before about Micas is sort of <coughs> has this element as well, appreciation of the nature of the Maltese islands but also bringing back some of that nature back into the city and providing so much benefits. However, I think my question is about how can we mainstream this? How can we make such practices wider than MICAS? MICAS is such a positive, will become, I hope, a positive experience and make this mainstream, something which is happening all the time. And there, I, I think there's so many factors. You, the panel now, have been mentioning so many things, education, technology, I don't fully agree with the technology aspect, <laughs> but, um, but technology, um, the readiness of society. So how can, we, how can we bring all of these together into authorities, organizations, uh, people who are developing projects uh, and proposing them? So how can we mainstream this? This is my question. Can I uh, say something from a horticultural perspective in, in regards to how to roll it out, as it were? Um, if you um, create a space which is not only easy to maintain, you're working with nature, you, it's sustainable, but it looks beautiful, it will just inspire people to take it home and ask for it to have it at their places. I also hope that if it's easier to maintain, we can do away with, I don't know, petunias that need replanting every four months and need a relentless amount of watering and that have no benefit to the ecosystem at all. And that, that way of just having that first stepping stone of beauty and sustainability and ease all makes sense, right? So let's just hope it just inspires and it rolls it out in that simplistic way. I truly believe it can happen. It's the first step where someone just said, so as a stepping stone. A stepping stone, yes. So, I don't know, in, in our case, I think the more we collaborate with different um, sectors, I think Micah is very open uh, to this sort of um, conversations and opening up conversations. Mainstreaming, I think, is, is what we all want. We all want. I think it, it also makes sense in, in terms of how we can also apply all the all the targets we all need to reach and we have, that we have to keep in mind. So I think bring, bringing everyone around the table and, and sharing experiences and also seeing where we can um, address, you know, the pressing needs um, on, a, on a national level, I think that that is one of the way in which we, we, we can become catalysts and in which I'm very convinced that culture can become a catalyst. I mean, it's already happening, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that, that are happening. So I, I'm not going to be, I don't think it's all negative. I think it's, there's a very positive, um, uh, you know, uh, th there's a positive element and certainly things are rolling. So I'm, I'm going to be... Um, I'm going to be, what's the word? I'm going to be positive. Hopeful. <laughs> hopeful. I'm going to be hopeful. <laughs> I think, you know, as a visitor yesterday, I was given a tour of the Mika site yesterday. 
And between Phyllis and Georgina, they sort of poetically explain, hopeful, <laughs> that, you know, not only do you engage nationally, but you're also projecting the values, the visions, the imagination that you have for a small location to an incredibly huge world. And I think that's really, really positive. I, I've never been more sort of inspired by the two of you, Phyllis and Georgina. I mean, you know, and the building that we, the site, the building, the potential of the building that we saw yesterday, it was just absolutely incredible, you know. So we could all live in hope. That's true. Thank you once again for the um, thought-provoking morning. I've got so many thoughts that I don't know how to head, make heads or tails of them now. But um, one thing that really struck me was the fact that we talked about engagement and the bottom-up approach and to get people involved, do it with them rather than for them. And we talked about nature and green, but one of the colors that I think we haven't mentioned is blue in the sense that we've talked about water of I'm sorts. And I was a bit struck by one of the slides that um, Stephen put up when he talked about green infrastructure being just roofs and walls. And I was wondering, Not just from ideas. that perspective, from a, a top-down approach, when you are asked by um, um, entities or uh, uh, authorities like infrastructure and water, for example, for the re redevelopment of open spaces, how much of ERA's say come into play in the sense that would you, would you be able to impose to a certain extent things like bioswales and suds and other green slash blue infrastructure that would be part of our everyday life are so important to maintain you know, flood risk and things like that. So I was wondering whether maybe you could give us some insight on that. Yes. As I told you, usually these discussions take a long, a long time. So during these discussions, we always try to understand the priorities of the project, which are usually not environmental targets, but could be transport, could be education or something else. So we understand that the priorities are not always nature. And we try to input our views by making um, uh, areas, by even taking environmental considerations in the long term, like transport. Of course, these are discussions we cannot impose, as, as you said, because this is not an authority imposing on the other. But this is trying to find the right balance for the national um, benefit. Usually, um, environmental uh, concerns need also additional funding to incorporate into such projects, which are not always available because projects are limited by funds. So trying to integrate a green area within a project which was not initially thought of as an environmental project is not easy. But I think with, with success, even through these discussions, even other authorities now come with a pre-open um, uh, mind for, for such ideas because they know that um, even the public are now requesting such um, aspects within the project. Thank you, Thank Stephen, you, no for that explanation. I think uh, we can close the discussion now. Thank you very much to our panelists, to our moderator, to you who posed your questions once again. We're nearing the end of our conference for this morning, and I would like to now welcome the Honorable Minister for National Heritage, the Arts and Local Government, Dr. Robin Bonnici. Good afternoon, uh, Professor Lim. Thank you for being here with us this morning, Dr. Mario Balzan, Professor Conrad, uh, Mr. Saliba, um, Dr. Greg, Dr. Portelli, Mr. Dara. Um, thank you, Conrad, uh, for uh, moderating the session. I would like to thank the, all the members of the audience. Uh, we have art historians with us. We have arch artists, architects, environmentalists, students, historians, uh, gen the general public, I thank you so much for being 
here with us this morning. The first thing I would like to share with you is a, a quote which is um, uh, frequently given to Albert Einstein. Um, the quote goes as following, that creativity is the bringing together of imagination and fun. So I, I'm very in favor of discussing imagination and how to push it forward, but I would also like to discuss the, the aspect of fun, which unfortunately is becoming rare in the discourse, which we do every day. It's nice to have fun. It's nice to, um, to have fun in doing something and being creative and, and bringing together the imagination and what you feel inside your heart. So please, let's, let's have fun. Let's enjoy what we do. The need for solutions that can secure a sustainable future has been increasingly brought to the fore over the, re the last years, not least in view of the challenges posed by climate change, but also because of issues related to environmental degradation and the hard-hitting experience of the COVID pandemic. In this context, we are more than ever conscious of the importance of nature to society and the validity of nature-based solutions to societal changes and what they can contribute to the social dimension of sustainable urbanization. This is, after all, the concept of Baukultur, which is so important on a European level, of course. Access to green space is related to people's perceived happiness and having fun and general well-being and we are committed to improving the well-being of our communities. Culture and cultural heritage, like Anton said before me, can be instrumental in realizing inclusive and sustainable development. And we are committed to this in the spirit of mainstreaming sustainable development. MICAS is a leading example of this um, Intent, intention which we have. There is no doubt that the risk preparedness and strengthening resilience to climate change in cultural heritage and the creative industries is also the best way to ensure their survival. We are responsible as a country with a very small jurisdiction but with heavy responsibility for not less than three world heritage sites. Not one, not two, but three the megalithic temples, the Halsaflini Hypogeum, and of course the city of Valletta, which in size is Europe's smallest city, but which in itself boasts a number of beautiful historic public gardens. This responsibility as guardians of these sites requires our utmost effort. As of January of this year, I'm pleased to say, an overarching policy of the management of green areas falling within the responsibility of Heritage Malta, our national agency for museums, conservation practice and cultural heritage has been introduced. This new policy will ensure environment-friendly practices and ecological management at our heritage sites, aiming towards self-sustainability, enriching biodiversity, and encouraging, where necessary, ecological restoration. This policy also looks at promoting these areas as habitats for national heritage, such as rare species of flora and fauna, while simultaneously increasing sources for pollinators. This will also help to draw visitors' attention to the importance of landscapes, habitats, and ecosystems within heritage sites. In line with the sustainability pillar, of the European Framework for Action for Cultural Heritage, the objectives of the European Green Deal and the UN 2030 Agenda, our efforts are also focused on the regeneration of cities through cultural heritage, like we did in Valletta. Our investment in new cultural and green infrastructure is mindful of these goals. We are committed to an enhanced but sustainable urbanization through nature-based solutions that can stimulate economic growth, because we need economic growth, as well as significantly improve the environment. This will make our cities much more attractive, while crucially also enhancing the well-being of our citizens. We want to implement this vision 
through the adaptive reuse of heritage buildings and the development of green infrastructure. We are also working towards balanced access to cultural heritage, to sustainable cultural tourism, and the focus on national heritage. We are equally committed to both our tangible, intangible, and also our natural heritage. They all deserve our attention. Furthermore, as the government program for culture outlines, we'll continue to invest in the restoration of bastions. We have managed to restore all the bastions around Valletta, it took us uh, 11 years, and now we are focusing to restore the bastions around Cotonera, and I am hopeful that this effort, which is multi-million, you know, to, to, to restore a small stretch of bastions, it would cost you easily around about a half a million euros. So imagine the investment we're putting there, and I'm pretty sure that people will be um, very happy to see us moving forward on this project. Now let's turn to Micus. Micus embodies this vision and this commitment. The repurposing of the historic landscape of the old Ospizio site to the restoration of bastions and the development of the sculpture garden and new galleries will now reclaim an area of around 7,000 square meters, 7,000 square meters for public use. The new garden on the San Salvatore counter guard with a footprint of 2,500 square meters will add to the green corridors provided by Floriana's existing public gardens and the surrounding green spaces. The MICAS project will also contribute to substantially enlarging the existing green lung of Floriana and the harbor areas. Moreover, MICAS will also be instrumental in nurturing creativity and our internationalization efforts by providing art artists not just with indoor galleries, but with a new green platform nestled within a unique historic landscape overlooking Malta's spectacular harbors. Let us not underestimate culture's power to engender change. Culture has valid contributions to make towards green growth that will ultimately help the future proofing of society, it will help to foster resilience as well as citizen well-being. Culture can contribute by championing good practices for decoupling urban development from urban nature loss. The MICAS project illustrates this approach and also champions it. In this spirit, I am really glad to have had the opportunity to be here, to be here with you guys today and to hear from the speakers that are with us. They have provided us with ample food for thought to reflect on how we can spearhead green growth, how we can spearhead urban regeneration through innovation, through interventions, and nature-based solutions to chart the way forward. I thank you so much. Thank you, Minister, for your remarks. Thank you for attending this conference. That brings us to the end of this year's edition of the MICAS Education Conference. Our speakers, thank you very much for being with us. And on behalf of MICAS, I wish you all a very pleasant weekend. Thank you.